Everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Welcome to the April 26th County Board Recess Meeting. This is Chair Crystal speaking. For those who may be following along at home, I'm joined today by my colleagues, Vice Chairman Dorsey, Mr. Karen Tonis, Ms. Garvey, and Mr. DeFerranti. Um, we will begin, as per custom, with some recognitions and reports um, from the Board and Manager. First, we have a number of recognitions and proclamations this month. April, it appears, is a busy month. Um, so, uh, in no particular order except for the one that's been given me, I would like to begin begin with um, a proclamation recognizing Holocaust Remembrance Day, um, which is uh, a day commemorated, of course, internationally, but particularly in our region. Um, the Jewish Community Relations Council uh, organizes a number of recognitions throughout uh, Northern Virginia, as well as uh, some pretty meaningful activities. So I will read only part of this, which is to just note that um, whereas the Holocaust was the state-sponsored systematic persecution and annihilation of European Jews by Nazi Germany and its collaborators, between between 1933 and 1945, and while Jews were the primary target, with six million murdered, other ethnic and religious groups were also victimized. And pursuant to a 1980 Act of Congress, the United States Holocaust Memorial Council designate days of remembrance each year to recall and reflect on the crimes committed and endure the memory and legacy of lives lost will not be forgotten. So whereas April 28th, 2022 is the date recognized around the world as Yom HaShoah or Holocaust Remembrance Day, and on May 1st of 2022, the Jewish Community Relations Council Yom HaShoah commemoration to be held virtually will honor the lives of those living and deceased affected by the Holocaust, calling to mind their courage, forbearance, and strength. Therefore, uh, it is my honor as chair of the county board to proclaim Thursday, April 28th, as Holocaust Remembrance Day and uh, urge all Arlington County residents to rededicate themselves to bear not silent witness to anti-Semitism nor any injustice and to remain vigilant to the principles of a just society. Uh, particularly meaningful, I think, given current events happening around our globe. Um, to a, uh, uh, our next proclamation is one that I believe we have a number of people in attendance for. Appreciate this opportunity to recognize um, Correctional Employees Week nationally and here in Arlington County. Um, so uh, an acknowledgement of uh, all that the folks represented by the sheriff and her team do. Um, Whereas the Arlington County Detention Facility receives over 3,422 persons for commitment annually and manages an average daily population of over 253 inmates. And whereas the operations of the facility represent a crucial component of the county's criminal justice system. And whereas correctional personnel play a vital role in protecting the right of the public to be safeguarded from criminal activity while being responsible for the safety and dignity of human beings charged to their care. And whereas correctional personnel provide a professional and compassionate service to the community at large and do their work under demanding circumstances facing danger in their daily work lives. Now, therefore, I, as the chair of the county board, along with my colleagues, proclaim May 2nd through May 8th as Arlington County Correctional Employees Week. And we urge our citizens to join us in recognizing the efforts of the men and women who work in the Arlington County Detention Facility and the Sheriff's Office. So thank you all so much. Thank you for being here. Um, and I, since we've got you here, I'm happy to present the sheriff with this proclamation. Okay, um, another month particularly uh, close to my own heart, if I can take that point of personal privilege. Um, April is also Sexual Assault Awareness and Prevention Month, and I am so glad to be joined today uh, on behalf of what I know is many, many partners in Arlington County. Um, Candace Lopez, who is the, current, the um, Director of Project Peace in Arlington County, um, to share, receive a proclamation. Um, uh, it is, uh, uh, a, a slightly long one, so I'm gonna bring just a, high, a couple of highlights forward and then take the opportunity to just call out one facet of this community's multifaceted work when it comes to sexual assault awareness and prevention. So Sexual Assault Awareness and Prevention Month calls attention to the fact that sexual assault violence is widespread and impacts every person in this community. And whereas the vision for Arlington County is one in which Arlington is a peaceful and respectful community where diversity is celebrated, violence is not tolerated, and all people are empowered 
empowered to build healthy relationships free from fear and threat of domestic and sexual violence. And Arlington is dedicated to addressing the issue of sexual violence, ensuring perpetrators are held accountable, and those impacted by sexual violence are offered timely, appropriate services. And whereas in Arlington, we know that young people in our community specifically are impacted, as seen by statistics indicating that half of eighth 10th and 12th grade Arlington Public School female students have experienced sexual harassment at school, and 20% have been sexually assaulted by a dating partner. And whereas Arlington Sexual Assault, Res Assault Response Team and our Project Peace Team work collaboratively to support, support joint response policies to ensure consistent, coordinated approaches to supporting those who've experienced sexual assault. And whereas any Arlington resident, regardless of age, gender, socioeconomic status, race, sexual orientation, ability, and or immigration status, has access to a comprehensive array of services from our 24-7 crisis hotline and police and medical assistance to ongoing mental, legal, and housing supports. Whereas the Arlington County Board recognizes that the prevention of sexual violence is possible and strongly supports the efforts of national, state, local partners, and of every citizen to actively engage in efforts, including conversations conversations about what sexual violence is, how to prevent it, how to help survivors connect with services, and how every segment of our society can work together to better address and prevent sexual violence. Now, therefore, I, as the chair of the county board, proclaim April 2021 as Sexual Assault Awareness and Prevention Month in Arlington and urge our residents to learn more about preventing sexual violence and to support the numerous organizations and individuals who provide critical advocacy, services, and assistance to victims and survivors. So um, following my own exhortation to take the opportunity to educate others about Arlington and how to reach out for services and supports, I'm so glad, courtesy of Candace, to provide my colleagues and our staff with a couple of the newest resources from the Project Peace Team, um, which includes a, it's a wallet card that includes information um, about Title IX and where to learn more about the rights of students within APS. And on the back includes um, links to uh, resources all around the county for people who maybe have been victimized recently or are in need of those ongoing services referenced in the proclamation. Um, as we talked about, I think I had the opportunity to spotlight a couple um, months ago during a board meeting. Um, there is particular kudos due to Candace, her colleague Ashley Blow, who works um, as a prevention specialist uh, in DHS, and especially our Teen Network Board and Healthy Relationships Task Force, um, which has been engaged in a lot of hands-on work with their colleagues, um, or their, their classmates, rather, and with teachers to help ensure that, ensure that teachers throughout APS particularly at the secondary levels, um, are aware of the resources for students and are aware um, um, how to educate and prevent um, instances of sexual harassment and sexual assault. So um, we are really excited to, to um, release that. You can see the Healthy Relationships Task Force um, on display there. I believe those really fabulous um, uh, consent is hot. T-shirts are still available for sale online. So uh, if you go probably to the Project Peace website, you, you too can match our awesome Healthy Relationships Task Force. Um, and just want to take the opportunity, Candace, Thank you so much. I'm going to present you with the proclamation for all of the work that you do tirelessly, not just on Sexual Assault Awareness and Prevention Month, but 12 months out of the year. Please do, we can get you more if, uh, if she'd like to help distribute. Okay. All right, gonna get my steps in doing these proclamations today. All right, so we have just uh, two more to go. Again, April, busy month. So um, we are also observing and acknowledging Emergency Preparedness Month um, and specifically um, recognizing our uh, public safety telecommunications staff. So. Um, whereas April 2022 is an Arlington Preparedness Month as declared by the Department of Public Safety, Communications, and Emergency Management, and whereas Arlington Preparedness Month seeks to increase public awareness about the importance of preparing for emergencies, encouraging individuals to be better prepared, and preparedness, of course, goes beyond fire alarms, deadbolt locks, and extra food, whereas the Department of Public Safety, Communications, and Emergency Management and the Emergency Preparedness Advisory Commission, EPAC, 
encourage Arlingtonians to prepare for emergencies in their homes as well as their businesses and schools. And whereas Arlington County encourages residents to be informed about different threats, make an emergency supply kit, make a family emergency communications plan, sign up for free training opportunities and alerts, and get involved in protecting our community because preparedness is everyone's responsibility. Now, therefore, I, as chair of the county board, hereby proclaim the month of April 22 as Arlington Preparedness Month and urge all citizens to take steps to protect themselves and their loved ones by preparing for emergencies. Um, we will pass that on to our, uh, to our um, fabulous staff within the Department of Public Safety Communications. And finally, last but <clears throat> certainly not least, a really exciting anniversary happening in our community. Um, next month, we're going to read this proclamation now for an event that will be upcoming um, uh, on Friday, May 13th, uh, and, and encourage community members to join. The John M. Langston Citizens Association is celebrating its 85th anniversary. So, whereas the John M. Langston Citizen Association was established in 1937 as the civic voice of Halls Hill Highview Park community by a group of neighborhood residents, and it is one of the oldest civic associations in Arlington, and whereas the John M. Langston Citizens Association's primary purpose is to advocate for the residents of Halls Hill Highview Park neighborhood towards civic improvement of the community and to work for equality and equity for all Arlingtonians, including the desegregations of schools, lunch counters, juries, and other forms of discrimination and matters of civic interest, regardless of political and partisan affiliation. And whereas the John M. Langston Citizens Association has long encouraged the county government to address issues in the community, providing municipal water and sewer systems to our community, giving equal pay to our fire station eight firefighters who protected the community from fires, and advocating, advocating for community development from our neighborhood. And whereas the John M. Langston Citizen Association supports equal rights for all Virginians and has been an important contributor in making Arlington a diverse, inclusive, and more equitable community, and this year marks the 85th anniversary of the John M. Langston Citizens Association, now, therefore, I, as chair of the county board, hereby proclaim Friday, May 13th, as the day to recognize the John M. Langston Citizens Association's 85th anniversary in Arlington, and urge all residents to celebrate the anniversary of this important community organization, and let the events surround it, inspire them to become more curious and thoughtful about Arlington's diverse communities and their history. Okay, thank you so much. And again, uh, there are a variety of activities. I know that the John M. Langston Citizens Association will be hosting. Um, we uh, look forward to them uh, the weekend of May 13th. Okay, because I have taken up so much time already, I have no further chair's report. <laughs> I am going to move right into appointments. <clears throat> Okay, so I, colleagues, I'm going to move the following appointments to the Citizens Advisory Commission on Housing. I move that we appoint Eric Lee for a term ending April 30th of 2026. And to the Commission for the Arts, appoint Joshua Ellis, Susan Manis, and Natopia Nuwakoma for a term ending, all for terms ending April 30th of 2025. To the Commission on Aging, appoint Kathleen Cameron and Charles Sabatino for terms ending April 30th of 2025. To the Commission on the Status of Women, appoint Janine Finch and Rachel Johnston for terms ending April 30th of 2025. To the Community Development Citizens Advisory Committee, reappoint Laura Malikoff for a term ending April 30th of 2025. To the Sports Commission, appoint David Lansing for a term ending April 30th of 2024 and reappoint Justin Wilt for a term ending December 31st of, 20, December 31st of 2022. To the Transportation Commission, appoint Thomas Shannon for a term ending April 30th of 2025. And to the Trespass Vehicle Towing Advisory Board, appoint David Kennedy for a term ending April 30th of 2025. I do not believe I need a second, but I will call for a vote. All those in favor of those appointments, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that carries unanimously. Congratulations to our new and returning commissioners. We appreciate your service. Um, before we move on from commissions, I know that um, our, uh, uh, our liaison to the Commission on Aging um, has a couple of bylaw updates um, from the commission to bring forward to us. So Ms. Garvey, I turn it to you. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. And um, colleagues have, have seen this um, by email, and there is a, a hard copy at your desks. Um, 
you know, about every seven to eight, I've actually got the history going back to 1983, it's back every seven to eight or nine years, um, these bylaws are updated, which makes sense. Um, and most of it is, you know, kind of just bringing things up to, with FOIA and, and all of those kinds of things. There also is um, a, a mention of diversity and trying to get diversity on the commission, which we're working for everywhere. So there's nothing particularly controversial here. So if it's all right, um, I'm happy to entertain questions, which I may or may not be able to answer, but um, I would like to move, make a motion if I might. I move to adopt the proposed amendments to the Commission on Aging Bylaws as presented. Second. Thank you. Is any discussion? No. Um, Great. I, I second. Excellent. Yep. And I just want to thank the Commission on Aging. They're doing great work. Um, I've I've been having fun interviewing the new people coming on. There's just a lot of exciting work to be going here. We're all aging, clearly. And uh, <laughs> it's just, um, you know, it's, it's nice to have our folks doing these commissions. I think it makes a big difference for us here in Arlington. And we just keep these uh, orders going and need to re-up these. And I'm happy to have everybody supported, I hope. Absolutely. Yeah, we really appreciate, I think, by far one of our mo most robust commissions with their network of subcommittees. They're, oh, they're and amazing. And then you were at the, con the, the conference with me, with the speaker yes. that was fabulous. Yeah, it was fabulous. Oh, excellent. Well, thank you so much. Okay, unless there is any further discussion, um, that motion is on the table. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That carries unanimously. Thank you to the Commission on Aging. Um, regarding board member reports, I'm going to turn it to Mr. DeFran, who I believe has an update for us on the Food Security Task Force. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I just have one slide. Um, we have arrived at a, 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 an important sort of uh, moment in that we have, uh, the Urban Institute has completed its benchmark analysis. Um, and I uh, have had a chance to participate in, in sort of summary discussions, look through uh, the report. Um, there are some important pieces to it. And now we move into a stage where we uh, consolidate those um, insights and absorb it and then uh, review the findings and recommendations to see what investments or what we could do next to act on this food food insecurity uh, study. And so there are a couple of neighborhoods uh, in Pentagon City and Crystal City that were a touch surprising to me that there was um, challenges with food there. Um, but what I thought I'd do is um, uh, just sort of mention that we finished this. At some point, a, I might recommend a, a succinct presentation of the study. But that's not for today. I just wanted to share that we finished this. The report's available um, for your ease. I'll shoot it around via email when you have copious extra time, time to, to, to read or even to look at the executive summary. But it is a very helpful report. And uh, it's an import, important first step so we know what, where we are and can see what steps we can take to move forward. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. DeFranti. I look forward to reading that. As you noted, it is interesting. We think we sort of know where the pockets of uh, um, need or risk are in our community, and so it's always really enlightening to look at it through, through a different index. All right. Um, thank you again for that really important work that is underway. Um, we move now into regional reports, and I believe um, Mr. Karen Tonis has an update for us about the Clean Air Partner Posters Contest. Oh, yes. This is... Uh... <laughs> This is on a lighter and uh, you know more more cheerful note here. Uh, we we just celebrated uh, um, the uh, Earth Earth Week and Earth Day on on Friday. Uh, so um, I I just wanted to use I don't know if uh, Mr. Mason has the uh, the slides because it's a visual thing. A poster is a visual thing. Well, I thought I, I sent that. That's OK. I just, I'm, I'm going to just report. There is an organization, um, because we are in May. Uh, May 2nd to May 6th is uh, Air Quality Week. So the organization that, that does the most outreach on, and, and most education on air quality at the beginning of the ozone season is Clean Air Partners. This is a nonprofit that is uh, uh, operating in all in the entire metropolitan region, including Baltimore, I believe. So we are participating in that. And uh, they also have a, uh, an educational pro uh, program, something that works uh, in, in schools. They, they actually support a, a school curriculum. And every year, they do a poster contest among uh, middle school uh, students. And this year, the winner is uh, Julia Hernandez Coca, a sixth grader from our Williamsburg Middle School. This is the reason why I wanted to report that. I was out. I was extremely happy to see that. This is really important. Um, I uh, 
hope that through social media can, we can we can divulge and uh, uh, support her design. She is really touching on the important issues uh, that this uh, uh, you know Earth Earth Day and Earth Day Week uh, Earth Week has touched upon. Uh, there is a lot of there is a lot of she designed around emissions. She designed also around the problem and around the solution. So I'm very, very, I will be very excited to do that. I, I, unfortunately, apparently, my, my slide is not there, but we will uh, try to make up for that next week. Oh, there we go. There might be more. Do we have ah, the post? Here it is. More. Uh, another one. Another one. This is the, the poster. Oh. Uh, and if you see that, this is actually it starts with a you know, a Mother Earth as a flower that is in literally in flames. You slide. So, uh, and, and everything that a sixth grader in Arlington perceives as a, as a real problem, like, for example, the emissions from cars, the forest fires, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the loss of, of trees, uh, the use of, um, of aerosols, still chemical aerosols, uh, even cow manure. Even I was pretty, pretty impressed by how much, how many topics uh, Julia has covered in that, and that is the problem, so to say. And she then expressed the hope and the way forward with a second element in her design, which includes all the good things from 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 uh, recycling to uh, the clarification of transportation. I was extremely pleased to see the. Uh, the, the 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 vegetarian or the kind of the, the changing diet. Um, of course, there, we, you you see um, uh, renewable energy production there, uh, planting in tree. Public transit is part of this, and uh, and of course the, the the preservation of natural environment in form of natural forests, etc. So I was really very impressed by what Julia uh, did, and I hope to be able to to meet her and uh, to. Uh, uh, hear from her how she came to this. And how wonderful that a representation of public transit is a bus and Absolutely. not a train. I love Yulia. That Absolutely. is awesome. <laughs> that is great. There are many, many details in her uh, in her representation of what she learned through uh, Cleaner Partners uh, that uh, have really impressed me. Uh, I thought this was really great. That's and it's now the, the winner for this year, so this will be circulating all over the the metropolitan area. I love that. Well, thank you so much for bringing that to our attention and congratulations uh, to Julia. Fantastic. Okay, so unless there are any colleagues reports that I've missed, I'm gonna turn things over to the manager who I believe, excuse me, has <clears throat> three updates for us this afternoon. So Mr. Manager. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm gonna go a little bit out of order because we're waiting on, I think Mr. McCauley to come here, but I'm gonna give you the update, my monthly update on COVID. And, um, you know, for the big picture, the surest sign that COVID is still very much with us, besides the fact that uh, Mr. DeFerrante was uh, uh, not with us for a few days, um, and the fact that uh, my beloved Red Sox are dealing with some uh, issues um, with their, a lot of their catching staff on the COVID-19 uh, list, is that Arlington County's community level is now medium, according to the Centers for D Disease Control. And so let me talk a little bit about, about that. Arlington has been in this medium category for a couple of weeks now, and um, we've now just been recently joined by the District of Columbia, Alexandria, and Manassas Park City. And the CDC's community levels are comprised of three elements that go into this. Uh, total number of new reported cases, hospital beds being used by COVID-19 patients, and then also COVID-19 hospital admissions. So fortunately, there has not been a significant rise in the two hospital measures. However, the case rate per 100,000 people is over 200, which pushes Arlington into the medium category. Our public health division director led by, uh, our public health division led by uh, Dr. Ruben Varghese, our public health director, has determined this increase is due to ongoing sustained transmission and the processing of delayed lab reports from the Omicron surge. So what does a medium level mean for the community? If you are at high risk for severe illness, Talk to your health care provider about whether you need to wear a mask and take other precautions. Stay up to date on your COVID-19 vaccines. Get tested if you have symptoms. As you might expect, we're also seeing a rise in our positivity rate. Arlington's seven-day positivity rate last week was about 12%, the highest since January. 
this rise is not unexpected because we know we're still experiencing a pandemic and we're still seeing transmission of COVID in our region. Fortunately, our hospital systems have the capacity to respond and especially because so many of our residents age five and above have been vaccinated. Um, so thanks to that really in our high levels of immunity, the risk of uh, significant disease and hospitalization and death has really been greatly reduced. And at the same time, we know that for our older citizens and those who are immunocompromised and people with disabilities and higher risk for a serious illness, um, there are some real challenges. I myself went and got my second booster last week and I encourage everybody who uh, fits into the category of being over the age of 50 or has those uh, conditions I just mentioned to please do it. In Arlington, we have 88% of the people uh, five and older have received at least one dose and close to 80% are fully vaccinated. Um, and I want to thank our public health division, something that I never thought I would be saying. Uh, we just administered our 200,000th COVID-19 vaccine last week. Our two clinics at Arlington Mill and Walter Reed continue to offer vaccines and boosters five days a week. No appointment, no health insurance. Come in and get your shot or get your booster. Everyone five years and older should get fully vaccinated and everyone 12 years and older should get a booster. And um, we have all this detail on our COVID webpage. We're also seeing about 2,800 PCR tests per week at our five curative kiosks, and that's a 50% increase from a few weeks ago. The kiosk right here outside the Bosman Building at Courthouse Plaza is now also offering no-cost rapid molecular tests, which means you will get your results in two hours. Um, you don't have to wait a whole day for that result, and it's recommended for people who've been exposed to COVID-19 who need same-day testing results. Um, our emergency management team recently distributed uh, 77,000 rapid at-home test kits. They were distributed in the weeks right before spring break uh, through Arlington schools. And tests were also distributed at the metro stations in the county, parks, libraries, and through our social safety net partners with a focus on those who are less likely to have access to other testing resources. Uh, not sounding a little bit like Mr. Miyagi, but Mask on, mask off. Um, in case you have been paying, haven't been paying attention in the last week, the CDC um, order that required masks on public transportation is no longer in effect uh, by a ruling of a federal judge. So quickly following that ruling, many places shifted to a mask optional policy, including Metro, Uber and Lyft, and the airlines. And on our art buses, masks are now strongly encouraged, but not required. The Justice Department is uh, officially appealing that ruling and we await uh, the outcome of that. In the meantime, people need to use common sense and do what's appropriate for them. We'll continue to monitor our latest guide, the latest guidance. And, you know, I think that for a lot of people, I've heard them say, yeah, I'm just, we're just done with this, we're done. But um, actually, please, please exercise your personal responsibility and look out for other people, wear a mask if appropriate and take care of your uh, fellow family members and your friends and our citizens. So that is my report update on COVID. I'm happy to take any questions. And if I can answer them, I will. Thank you. Question from Mr. Dorsey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, Mr. Manager, thank you for that. That was uh, an important update to provide to the community. And, you know, many may be done with COVID, but clearly COVID is not yet done with us. Um, so I, I guess the trying to make sure I form a question and don't uh, have it devolve into a commentary. But as you talked about the molecular tests that are available at Courthouse, why is it that those are only available at uh, one particular curative location or will it be coming to others? Um, they, we have it, my understanding is we also had it avail also available at Sequoia. So um, we're, as uh, we get the systems on board, our goal is to get it to all of the sites. It's just a matter of getting the equipment. Got it. Um, appreciate that, and I'll let others go ahead. Okay, great, Mr. DeFranti. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, um, my ex my experience a week and a half ago, or two weeks ago, two plus weeks ago, was sort of forty eight hours of, of an adjusted flu that had symptoms that 
weren't overwhelming, but were different from what I'd had before. And then quickly I felt better, and then I was just every morning hoping that I would test negative, and then tested negative three times in one day, and then could rejoin everyone. Um, I, I think this is the case. It feels like that was the second strain of Omicron, at least from what I've read and, and was described. And you know, we eagerly look for the hospitalization numbers, but uh, you know, I, I think for months and months, you met every morning with uh, Dr. Varghese. But I still feel like if one of the additional strains, or if there's a strain that starts to lead to hospitalizations, I feel like it's just will be important to have that seamless communication that you guys have had so that we know as early as possible that we have a strain that is leading to more than just the 48 hour uh, piece that I had. And I don't know if you have, I don't want to, you know, it's your, your guys to work on the mechanics of all that, but I'm confident, I feel like it might be worth sh just sharing briefly if you're able, sort of the system of communication and how Dr. Varghese and you touch base and what would happen if you started to hear anecdotes and, and thought that there were policy issues that you might need to bring to the board or, or, or to the community? So I, I continue to be in communication with Dr. Varghese and then also with uh, uh, Dr. Miller. Um, and we are um, in constant communication. You are correct that the most recent uh, set of cases are based on the uh, subvariant of Omicron. I think that it's about three quarters of the current cases are that subvariant. And we um, monitor the hospitalization numbers. We get a, a weekly written update from all the uh, area health directors. And on an as-needed basis, I've had conversations with Ruben in the past week a few times. As far as right now, I think that focusing on hospitalization, I don't want to say there isn't anything new to be learned, because we're always learning new things about the effectiveness of the vaccines. But as far as the measures that people need to take, um, as long as we remain in the medium category, there isn't anything from a policy perspective that we would need to do. We still have the, um, uh, we're still in the state of emergency here in the county. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a, a little bit concerning that the uh, number of cases have ticked up, but I think that I even saw a report today that's saying as many as 60% of all the residents of the country may have had COVID at one point. Um, and that is a pretty shocking statistic, but at the same time, I think that also speaks to a little bit about how how the variants um, are not having as much of an effect on hospitalization. So that doesn't mean people won't get sick and don't need to pay attention. I'm getting way out of my depth here. I do not have a master's <laughs> in public health. So uh, if there's anything like that, I will be to you soonest and also to the community. We're still sending out regular updates and we know how to ring the alarm bell even though people may not be listening as much. Great, I was happy to have had the booster, didn't enjoy those 48 hours <laughs> and thought I was so careful, but that second strain seems even more transmissible, at least if, as I tried to recreate how I might have gotten it. But um, uh, thanks for being willing to ring the alarm bell if needed um, amidst this um, long pandemic. I understand the, the balance there. Thank you. Thanks so much. Appreciate that. Are there other questions or thoughts? <clears throat> well, the, um, the achievement of the 20,000th shot or 200,000th shot is particularly <laughs> remarkable. And I think a, a good opportunity to just reflect that um, this has been a, a, a long and ongoing journey in this community's effort to combat COVID and its spread. Um, there are, of course, these latest developments, and we really appreciate the continued work, Mr. Manager, of you and your team. So um, I'm going to move on uh, to what was going to be my last item. I'll, I'll, we'll do it right now. But you see, if you look out in the audience, Madam Chair, you see a number of very eager communicators and public engagers, um, various CAPE teams and CAPE knockoffs throughout the departments. Um, <laughs> so what I wanted to do is provide a communications <laughs> and, <laughs> and engagement update for you. Uh, you know, when I became county manager, one of my top priorities was to talk about enhancing our efforts and engagement and communications. And uh, this was right after the community facility study group said, you know, we needed, we had a number of challenges on how we engage the public. And we were trying to come up with consistent approaches on similar types of plans and projects. And we wanted to come up with processes that were consistent for decision makers. Um, and we knew that uh, we had some real challenges in getting input from a lot of parts of our community. And it's hard to believe, but we are just celebrated the fourth anniversary of our six-step six guide for public engagement. 
And since then, we've learned a lot about communicating and public engagement, especially over the last two years with COVID. And uh, I will be the first to admit, I've admitted it here, we don't always get it right. Um, but we've come a long way in weaving not just the old style corporate communications, but true engagement into our efforts as we develop and implement policies. And uh, as we're taking a breath at this point, I thought it was a good opportunity to have an update. And uh, we have with us uh, Bryna Helfer, who's Assistant County Manager for Communications and Public Engagement, Jerry Solomon, the Director of Public Engagement, and Jessica Baxter, the Director of Strategic Communications. And I'm sure they'll give a shout out to all the people uh, in the back of the room. And I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Helfer. Bryna? Thanks. Uh, yeah, before we get started, I, I just really do wanna thank the entire uh, CAPE team across government. We have, from four years ago, um, and Jerry, am I just advancing that? You know, we started uh, as Mark mentioned, you know, the community facility study called for a new approach. We set some very clear goals to build consistent practice, to strengthen our relationship with partners in the community, to weave communications and public engagement so they were not separate and apart, and to build capacity for both in-person and virtual tools and strategies. And across all the departments, um, we have been able to, to do that. Uh, in a way that we've never been able to do it before. And, and, and so we just want to refresh everyone today a little bit about the journey and about the guide. So we started with the community and the internal community and our external community back in 2016. And out of that, we set some values for public engagement about inclusion, about early and timely communication, about clear accessible language. We're going to talk more about all of this today, about doing it within a fiscally sustainable environment and for continuous improvement. And with that, we built a consistent approach. Um, think back five years ago, we were doing things differently for similar kinds of projects and similar types of plans. Now we have a guide. Um, and while we developed this guide for capital projects, we've seen it apply to planning and to policy making and to programs. So clearly defining the project, identifying stakeholders, determining our engagement, creating robust engagement strategies and communication strategies, analysis, and um, closeout. And again, because we wanted to refresh not only the board, um, but our community, internally and externally, I'm just gonna walk through the steps really briefly. Clearly defining the project. Our community said don't come and do a big visioning project if we're only talking about a small $50,000 approach. And so really clearly defining the project, the parameters, the scope um, at the front end and why we're engaging. What's the purpose of the engagement? Um, identifying our stakeholders, and Jerry's gonna expand a lot on this because I think we have clearly learned so much about working with trusted partners and doing things differently. Um, but one of the things that we still have to work on is getting those folks that are highly impacted but have really low awareness to high awareness and high impact. But we spend a lot of energy on people with low awareness, I mean, high awareness and low impact. And so really being intentional, and Jerry will talk to that in a little bit. So we, uh, as a government, had already ad kind of adopted the International Association of Public Participation um, framework, and so we built on that. Uh, communicate, consult, involve, and collaborate. And so just to refresh, the guide really s starts to help us answer the questions. What IAP2, the International Association of Public Participation, doesn't do is tell you when and where to apply those steps. So this allows us to really ask the questions about what is the change, <laughs> the more intensity of the project or the policy, um, the higher level of engagement, if that makes sense. So this is an illustrative list, but what I really want to point out um, in this, uh, maybe I can just use my mouse, is that you see that Really, at the collaborative level, it's much. There's fewer projects at the collaborative level. We do thousands of projects, um, right? And so we might be communicating if we're paving and putting things back in the same way, but where we're fundamentally changing things, our level of engagement intensifies. And so this is an illustrative list of examples. And the other thing that we've really taken um, great care is to build the capacity across every department to understand how to use and utilize the tools, both virtually and in person, and align them 
with the level of engagement. So we're not showing up to doing charrettes if we're just painting the bench, right? And if we're painting the bench um, or if we're changing the road and configuration, we're not just showing up and telling people of the roadway. So we're really aligning the tools and strategies with the level of engagement and training all of us to use the right tools and to bring neutrality, right? Um, so that we're using neutral facilitators, we're really looking at naming and framing, asking the right questions. Do we get it right all the time? No, but we're getting it right more often. And we really appreciate the community feedback that we get, both when people are uber engaged, like on Saturday with the Penn Place, and that went so well, and people coming to talk about the process, to projects where we need to um, realign and maybe step back and revisit. And with that, coming out of COVID, you know, first of all, this entire, everyone in this room and people watching on the communications and engagement side, this team, this communications and engagement team shifted a lot of our energy during COVID to COVID communications and, right, and outreach. But what we learned was we were able to shift from what we would typically do traditionally in person to virtually, virtual walking tours for site visits, right? We would have never imagined that. Hybrid public comment. That was on our dream list four years ago. COVID has allowed us to learn to do that. Coming out of COVID, we think we will be able to do some in-person things. We'll do some, continue to use our virtual platforms because the greatest thing has been like people participating while they're watching their kids' softball game. And that hybrid model where we come together with both. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jessica to talk about some of our communication strategies, thanks. Thank you, Bryna, and I have the pleasure of talking about my favorite topic, communications. Uh, as you've heard and will hear throughout this presentation is the weaving of communication and engagement is essential. Um, it's essential because communication is that common thread throughout a public engagement process. We also know that if there's a breakdown in a process, any communication that we try to do will likely fail. So continuing on with that is meeting people where they are. So we offer a multifaceted approach in our communications and pairing tools so that we can reach broad cross sections of the population. So digital tools work immensely well. Um, we have an Engage Arlington web page. We have Inside Arlington that reaches over 150,000 people. We have multiple subscribers on our listservs. However, there is a big disparity in that not everybody in our community has access to the internet or a mobile device. So how do we get to these people? We saw it very much during the COVID pandemic, this disparity, where we had to really think strategically on the tools that we were using to get to diverse cross sections of our community. So what did we do? Uh, we reached out to community partners, trusted um, organizations. We, we did a lot of flyering that could be easily shared to uh, businesses, community organizations, places of worship. Uh, you likely saw those yard signs and the medians and the variable message board signs, uh, traffic signs, uh, sharing information about testing and uh, vaccination efforts. And that's a practice we've continued for some of our major county efforts. You also saw that we likely did a lot more uh, direct mailers, like letters and postcards. And all of this, uh, I wanna note that was it was an emphasis on um, translating the materials as well. Um, we know that we need to make our information accessible, not just for those that are English and Spanish speakers, but also various languages that are so prominent in our community and using the uh, dashboard that Jerry will touch on later, uh, so that we can make that information accessible to our diverse audiences. Uh, so this is a visual graphic of a life cycle of a project. We use Lover Run in this one, and it is a little bit busy, but what it shows you is that at various points in the life cycle of a project, we align uh, community engagement. So during certain, um, you know, when, we're, when we're aligning them to certain periods in the life cycle, there might be higher levels of engagement or lower levels of engagement. And the reason why we do this is because we know that not many of our residents follow a process from start to finish. Uh, people might come in at various points of that process. So it's important for us as communicators and engagers to be able to show what has happened prior to that point and where we are going next. And uh, I have to say we've stepped it up a lot um, these past two years on utilizing visuals to really break down complex information. And this has been something that has been very important to me and to my fellow communicators here today. 
Um, it's a way to simplify complex information coming from the county and being able to translate it to the common layman's terms for, pe for people to easily understand the information we're trying to convey. So here are a few examples. The first one is the Barcroft acquisition, and it really just breaks down the deal um, at, for people to understand you know, the partnership and, and where um, you know, the money is being invested and, and what it means for affordable housing. Um, in the middle, you'll see the affordable housing infographic. We took a 900-page budget document and created six infographics. We distilled that information and made it easily readable, uh, highlighted um, the funding figures, the programs were being invested, and so taxpayers can see where their money is going to and where we're investing. Um, and then on the right, this is something I pulled from my days in DES. Um, yeah, I think this is about two years old, but breaking down the bond referendum for the stormwater system, which we heard a lot about from our community, on where the money was going, and just breaking down the types of projects that were going to be included. So how do you track all of this? Well, we have a uh, county website, and we still have the My Arlington Projects map on the left. Uh, where you can go onto the map, uh, type your address in, and you can filter information that's going on, projects that are happening in and around your neighborhood. Um, these uh, dots go to project pages, so you can learn more information. If there's active engagements, it will share that as well. Um, and the URL, URL is on the bottom of that. And then on the right uh, is the Arlington VA website. Um, last fall, we switched content management systems with a focus to put customer first. So on our homepage, you will see that um, a customer or resident can easily go and pay their bill, report a problem, request a permit, and then link to uh, key services that we used Google Analytics for. So these are the most highly trafficked uh, web pages and services. So if you if you see up there, you have parks and recreation. That's where it will take you to the seasonal uh, registration programs, and we have uh, recycling and trash as well as an example. And then you can drill down and explore uh, county projects, programs, and more. So with that, I am turning it over to Jerry Solomon. Thank you. So I just want to go back to one of the values that were mentioned um, early on in this presentation, which is continuous improvement. I personally feel like we are grounded in that. Um, so when we talk about, it, it kind of helps us reorient ourselves on the intention along the way and how it can be iterative and improved as we go. Um, so we know that we're in the business of gathering feedback from community members and helping in, uh, decision makers become more informed for um, their uh, policies or plans or next steps moving forward. And um, in that work, we are trying to design effective engagement opportunities that help um, make it beneficial for those who are making the decisions and those who are providing their feedback. Um, and in that work, we are conducting um, analysis, making sure that we are highlighting emerging themes along the way, um, gathering information of who is participating and who's not, and using that information to reflect on our processes. Um, how do we enhance our um, capture of that information to make it most effective to our community at large? Um, a lot of that is done with the um, guidance of the uh, racial equity lens. Uh, through the help of our chief in, um, race and equity officer, Samia Bird, we are um, applying the lens that you see on the screen right now to um, better recognize who benefits, who's burdened, who's missing, how do we know, and what do or did we do uh, about it in order to inform our processes and better connect with folks who might be missing from the conversation. Um, we also use the data in order to ground our process. Uh, a big shout out to Elizabeth Hardy, who's on this call, um, who is a principal demographer, demographer in CPHD and helped build um, both the race and ethnicity dashboard and the census tract dashboard, which helps us get a better idea of the community we serve, better understanding education levels, housing types, and more, so that we can better strategize around our process. And then, of course, 
Um, recognizing gaps in participation. Uh, we know that not everyone can make it to a Tuesday night meeting at 7 p.m., even if it is virtual. So getting a better understanding of the resources necessary, both in in-person and virtual environments, to help make it more accessible to folks um, so that they can um, be part of the engagement fabric as well. Um, part of that has been in building language access. So um, we know that through the data that our, highly, or our most highly spoken languages in the county are English, Spanish, Amharic, Arabic, and Mongolian. And we know that we need to provide pathways to understanding the information we put out and the avenues to collect um, community feedback in those languages as well as English. Um, so we've been incorporating more language accessibility into our work, making sure that we have translated signage in uh, frequently visited areas, um, using the data dashboard to identify areas that speak those languages so that we can be strategic about where we put that signage, making sure that we have interpreters at meetings or pop-up engagements so that people can participate in their native language. Um, continuing com and, uh, most importantly, continuing conversations with some of our trusted partners who come from those communities and can help us better understand where to reach people most effectively and how. Another part of expanding our outreach is um, diversifying the ways in which we approach our community members. We have found that um, not everything happens online, especially in those different languages. But we have found a lot more success when we meet people face to face where they are. So um, incorporating pop-up engagements at food distributions or multifamily buildings, grocery stores, and special events has allowed us to talk to people face to face and make these connections. Also, gathering feedback in real time. You might not be able to fill out an entire form that you would find online, but you can talk to a real person, answer one or two questions, still help us feel informed, and get more information about how to expand on your feedback. Um, people have also found it very helpful to see that our signage comes with QR codes that go directly to the opportunities. Um, and, um, you know, I think this has also helped us with the digital divide. It, at the pop-ups, we've been able to provide phone numbers to voicemails or text message options so that if you aren't online, you can still provide your feedback and it will be incorporated into the decision making. And then we, we know that one of our gaps is in reaching people who live in multifamily buildings. Um, with the help of Elizabeth Hardy again, we have been able to create a resource that I think is so exciting and going to be beneficial to us at large. It is the Multifamily Complex Directory. And it is a, a list of all of the multifamily buildings we have a record of right now and contact information that allows us to filter by civic association boundaries, zip codes, um, whether it's an apartment or condo or more. We know that. 60% of our population lives in multifamily buildings, and we want to make sure that we are strategizing our approach to gather feedback from um, people who live all across the county. So um, I would implore all of you to check it out. It's actually live right now on the county's website. If you search organizations, it's called the Multifamily Complex Directory. And then, of course, None of these resources could have been built without the um, information that we've gathered or the lessons learned from um, some of our most significant work over the past four years. Um, we know that um, our most valuable resource has been the trusted partners who help us better understand the community we serve. So we've been tapping into these networks like limited English speakers, nonprofits, faith-based leaders, multifamily buildings, of course, and our civic associations along with condo associations and other community leaders. Um, some of those examples would be like the com uh, Complete Count Committee or the Complete Vaccination Committee, which were headed by Elisa Ortiz, Wanda Pierce, and Nancy White, respectively, and helped us galvanize hundreds of volunteers and 40 community leaders who um, helped us share information and resources to the community about um, very important information that led us to a complete count and our vaccination rate today. 
and of course lessons learned from our work with the Community Progress Network, which started about four years ago and helped us better understand how to address those gaps that I mentioned earlier, like um, child activities or dinner or transportation, when we were able to host about four roundtable conversations with some of our lowest income residents about housing, transportation, and more. Um, giving us some of the most robust conversations that we've had in years. And I'm going to pass it back over to Bryna, who will take us out. Thanks, Jerry. Thanks, Jessica. And thanks for taking the time to just pause and take a break and celebrate the progress and recognize that we're not done. Um, you know, in all of this, whether we're talking about engagement practice, and I, and I talk to engagement practice because it is a practice, um, and there's not a clear path to that practice. Um, we all come from different disciplines, um, and we're all learning. And I, we've learned from all of you. And hopefully, you know, you've learned some things along with us. But we have continuously looking at designing for successful engagement, to aligning those tools and practice into building our internal capacity, um, to expanding our outreach. And Jerry talked beautifully to that, so I'm not going to stress that. But that's, it's never done. The work is never done, right? Um, Katie, your work in equitable engagement and the rest of the board, we're, gonna, we're learning so much through the UNUM project um, that will inform our work forward. Uh, and then, you know, this enhancing communication, the thread of communication throughout our work, so that regardless of when you enter our community or enter the process, that you have an understanding and that it's clear, accessible, and available. So that's really our goal. And so with that, I would just ask one more thing of everyone, internally and externally, Libby, we know we've had this conversation over and over about the challenge in mutual respect sometimes. People are passionate, we have a passionate community. Um, and that's good, that's a good thing. But recognizing there's many players, whether it's staff or commissioners or members of our community or the county board, that we all come to it with cooperation, communication and consideration of each other because we all have the same goal of having a community that's inclusive and the quality of life is available and that we can have access to transit and parks and live and work and play together. And that only comes in our process of mutual respect. So stay connected with us inside Arlington, sign up for your newsletter, sign up for unique um, topics, Share your feedback. We have an engage page that lists all active engagements you can find con constantly. Um, you know, visit our website and follow us on social media. And with that, we'll just say thank you to the board for your ongoing support of this work and thanks to the entire team. So thanks. Thank and guys. Mark, also to you yeah. for your leadership. More of an afterthought. <laughs> Happy to have a conversation if yeah. you have time or whatever. <clears throat> This is terrific. Thank you so much. I do think we have a moment for questions. Um, do you want to start, Mr. Dorsey? Do you want to start us off and then sure. Ms. Garvey and Mr. Friendy? Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you, Bryna and Jessica and Jerry and everyone else who's involved in this work. You know, some years ago, I, I, I spoke at length about my desire to see us professionalize public engagement in our county, and this is the realization of that vision and dream, and so I'm so grateful, and, and it's really been for the betterment of our community. Now that I've said the nice stuff, I'll, I'll point, point out some areas that I'd love to see our, our continued progress. So, you know, one, and this is not a, a, a commentary on, on your work, but just where our community is. We, we frequently hear of people, um, you know, claim that they don't know about something, you know, that we haven't communicated with them and we seem to spin in circles because through all the channels that you mentioned, yeah, we've put it out there. And, but it exposes that, you know, on our end, it is the responsibility to clearly uh, share across whatever channels we have, whatever it is we need people to know. But uh, for people in our community, it seems to be an expectation that it's government's responsibility to make sure they've heard it or to make sure it's been absorbed. Not sure that we can ever square that circle and reconcile it, but it's the world that we live in. And so I'm wondering if there are other ways in which we can further uh, ensure that the I didn't hear it, therefore it's your fault and you need to now accommodate my coming on board this process. We make sure that that doesn't derail what it is we're trying to do or prolong what it is that we're trying to do. So uh, 
inspired by something that Mr. Carantonis and I did this morning, uh, the, the Street Smart annual or, or semi-annual um, campaign. campaign to promote uh, awareness about traffic safety, particularly for the benefit of bicyclists and pedestrians. I'm wondering if we could do some public educate, public engagement education campaigns to let people know about all of the things that you shared with us today. If you want to be someone who knows what's going on, you need to do these tools and not just one. Because one of the things that I fear, uh, you all have a robust set of things that we are doing on a regular basis or innovating and pioneering uh, on an ad hoc basis. And whatever, whatever way someone came into a process of hearing about something, there's going to be the expectation that that tool is always going to be about how they hear about things. And that's not sustainable. So I'm wondering if we can, as circumstances allow, just periodically push out to our entire community, if you want to be in the know, um, here's the way you do it. Here are, the, here are the things you sign up for. Here are the things that you check on your own. Is that something that we can add to our repertoire? Absolutely. Um, we, thank you for that suggestion. And also, we're doing some work. Um, it's, it's not quite ready to be prime, prime time, but we are doing some work. Jerry's been leading with a number of people in the room and across the county. Um, we're using Crystal City as a pilot, where we're creating a mapping tool and a storyboard just about Crystal City, so that, because there's so much going on and there's so many avenues. So it's kind of like we hear, there's so much information, how do I tease it out? So thinking through some of that, we had a really good meeting with some leaders um, in that area. And if we can figure it out in Crystal City, we think we can figure it out for some other things as well. So I think it's an and, um, but thank you for the suggestion. Of course. And if I could, just one other very quick one. As it relates to the website, you know, I, I may be a dinosaur here, but I find the web to be a particularly useful tool, not necessarily for knowing what's going on today, but for doing research and analysis and, and, and developing an understanding of things that have happened historically. Yet with the, the migration to the new CMS, um, I've noticed that historical documents seem to be dated by when they migrated and not by when they were created, which has really made it difficult for me to actually do uh, productive searches and I find it very frustrating. So solve my problem, please, and, and let me know if this is something that can be fixed. Yes, thank you. Uh, we meet weekly with the D Department of Technology Services, and they have a pipeline, and we've been sharing with them our priorities of what we want to see improved. Search engine optimization is one of them, easily finding documents. Uh, we are talking about, and we're a few months out, of a document library. Uh, it will take extensive cleanup by the departments uh, to go through the documents and, and label and date them. But yes, I understand the frustration that the date that you see isn't the date that it was actually posted, but when it was migrated. Um, and that's something that just happened in the transition, um, in the migration. Um, as you all know, part of the reason why we migrated so quickly was because of the security concerns. And so um, essentially, when the switchover happened, um, we had to really kind of look at what added functionality we needed to go back in and fix. And that's one of those areas about the dates. Um, but it's, it's something we talk about weekly with DTS, and we're working with the departments. We have a governance group now to look at these issues and, and get buy-in from the organization to really improve uh, the user experience on the website, particularly to your point about the historical documents. And do we have a timeline, or is this something that's going to be so ongoing that it's tough uh, to think so about. So right now it. we're for focused on search engine optimization and building that up, and we're also going to be looking at mapping tools. But the document search library, I think we're going to start working on that this summer, um, meeting with the departments to, to kind of tackle that. Um, and so we're hopeful that this fall there would be some improvement. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, I think Ms. Garvey, Mr. Franti, and then Mr. Grantonis. Sure. I think one question and then a few, a couple comments. Um, so I've been I've talking to some folks in civic associations, and they've been saying, we have so much trouble reaching out to people. You have all of this data. Can you help us do that? Um, and I know there are all kinds of legal ways not to do that. But I have a, it has occurred to me that we have, on the old-fashioned um, sense, a lot of existing institutions that have been around a really long time. Um, and are we also thinking about how to maybe support and bring them up 
to speed a little bit. I don't know if that's a thought. You know, like I mean, we just have a lot of groups that really are, they, they, there's a whole organization set up that if we could tap that and if they were functioning really well, and I'm not saying they're necessarily functioning badly, but I think some of them haven't really made the step into the 21st century as well as they might, that that could actually strengthen what we do as well. Oh, yes. Um, so I've been with the county for a little bit now. Um, but pre-COVID, we had this series of conversations called Energize Arlington, um, where we focused on some of the things that we had heard from some civic association roundtables in 2018. Um, it you know, taught us that some of their biggest pain points are just understanding, you know, civic culture, how to get in with the county, um, you know, getting in with the multifamily buildings, and um, some other items that were hot topics that we centered the Energize Arlington series around. And these conversations allowed us to um, continue to gather that feedback, um, invite a bit of a brighter, uh, broader audience, and then develop tools out of the conversations that we had including a um, civic association president toolkit. Um, so now every time a new civic association president is, uh, comes into their role, we actually um, reach out to them, ask for a sit down, and um, we can go down the list of uh, really helpful resources. And I think they've you know, shared that they've appreciated it and used it um, consistently in their work. Um, and then it's just developing tools as we go. I mean, the um, multifamily complex directory is an example of a long-standing need that was um, expressed by folks from those conversations. And we're, you know, we've had some small wins along the way, but that's an example of a big win that helps us to that, to that greater capacity building that we know uh, our community needs. Thank you. No, I know that's great. And some of the things those buildings is you, you find out they're all there and have them all listed, you still can't get inside. And I know that that's hard. And I think we've talked at times about, um, well, you know, welcome packets when people move in. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'm happy to talk to you about that a little more and see where see where we are. I, I will say, listening to all this, one, I, when I first started getting involved in um, board work, 1996, we were talking about community engagement. And I had an, what's community engagement? What is it? I mean, that's how long, you know, it's really, and it's, it's really great to see how far we've come along. Um, I was thinking too that um, to some extent that's saying that repetition is the mother of learning. And I really like the fact that six years later you've come back, you're kind of re-energizing it and presenting it again and re-going over things. And I think we need to keep kind of repeating um, because it is so much information. Um, I think that's really helpful. I love the graphics. They, for one, a lot of people's eyes glaze over when you just sort of do government speak at them or you give them a page with all kinds of white, you know, white and black print on it. You don't even plan it. But this catches your eye, makes you kind of think, draws you in. That's great. And then I imagine there's an incredible discipline to try to hone it down. Um, some of them seem a little involved. It might make it a little hard for people to look at. But it did occur to me with the one, the infographic, particularly in Lubber Run, showing all the community engagement, because we do have these people who come and say, you didn't talk to us, you didn't do anything, you haven't, well, actually, yes, here we have, and here, and, you, and a picture is kind of worth a thousand words, so that's helpful. I don't think we'll ever get to the point that you won't have somebody coming to us and saying, you didn't tell me, and you need to stop this process now until I get caught up, but that's um, kind of another issue in some ways, too. So thank you very much. Really appreciate this, appreciate the update, appreciate uh, all the work you're doing. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Um, First thought is that looking out, there are different moments where uh, the professionals, communicators, you have seen the best uh, of me last year and the not best of me and, and all those moments. Um, and I feel as though you've been um, smart, professional and kind throughout. And I just that's an honest try way of trying to say, you know, you can't it's hard to spin a spin a communicator. And so you've seen the reality, and um, thank you for it over the last two years. Uh, second thought is I kind of feel on the mutual respect point, uh, I think probably most of you have thought about this, but I feel like we're coming out of a deficit there that is sort of related to the pandemic, but distinct. And we're going to have to like, you know, create that civility that we want. Um, and I don't know if that's a helpful frame for you all. And then the third thought, and maybe you might have just a little point on it or is I feel as though, you know, we started out, I started out three years ago saying that virtual had some big equity concerns. I've learned in some ways, I feel like virtual may have some equity benefits, but I feel as though there's sort of, I imagine that 
an hour brainstorming with amongst you as professionals to think about a little bit more nuance uh, on that. You may have already done it, but that's sort of the question because um, we do have folks who don't have the up and down speeds that they need, and uh, we're working on broadband, but um, I just wonder if, if, you know, you probably already have some ideas on that. We have new law on that, but that's an area for maybe I could envision a half hour or hour brainstorming. You guys could come up with some great ideas, and I don't know if that fits. Yeah, so a couple, couple things on that. One is um, I think throughout COVID, we, we made some assumptions that our lowest income residents um, or our residents that don't use like uh, English isn't their first language, might not participate virtually. But we learned something very different mm -hmm. during the trust conversations that you led. Um, and was just thrilled with over 60 participants in five, you know, we offered five different languages. We had, we ran three sessions in Spanish. I mean, it was really an eye opener, but we also had to use some different tools. Um, and so coming out of that, going into Throughout COVID, we've been doing all that boots on the ground work um, so that we recognize we couldn't do everything virtually, so we would go into the community. We've been going into the community, and we, we can't stop that. But I do think we learned some things from the trust conversation about how being intentional in other ways in a virtual world. Um, relative to the um, reference of the new electronic meetings bill, there's a whole conversation that we do need to have about how that will work. And we are meeting tomorrow morning with um, liaisons to go over the electronic meetings bill and look forward to working with you on how do we create a hybrid model. But as I mentioned, um, four years ago, we had on our dream list that people would be able to participate pu um, virtually in public comment. And we are doing, you, you're doing that. Um, you've led the way, and not every community is, and so thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Mr. Karen Thomas. Oh, thank you. Um, first of all, uh, I, I cannot overstate uh, how grateful I am, and I think I speak for almost everybody in Arlington for what you've done, done the last three years. So that was extremely important and extremely effective at the end. And uh, we're still, I mean, I, I do believe that there will be students, uh, not only of communications, that will be writing pa papers about that uh, relatively soon. And I believe I will find Arlington what, and the work that you all have done uh, in there uh, sooner rather than later, I believe. So I have a couple of questions. One is, um, we learned a lot from you, you learned a lot from us, we learned all together from our community, and there was a, a golden point on the sixth uh, level, it's after action review. So how, how are we structuring that? So we, we definitely do some after action reviews among ourselves, I, I believe that you're doing that as well, but how do we re cover that with our community? Yeah. Do we get back and say, how did we do? So first of all, I just want to make sure that um, we recognize Carrie Johnson for the sixth step. It was in this room that I had a conversation with Carrie about the sixth step and that she reinforced the importance of after action. Just yesterday, I said to Anthony, we should do an after action on Penn Place. Um, and I think you said, but it went so well. <laughs> we tend to think about after action as only things that don't go well. Um, and so Jerry has been starting to conduct after actions of our engagement practice. Um, we don't do it often enough, but for things, so we learn from our mistakes and our challenges and from the things that went well. And so we'll continue to do that work and to lead that work. I don't know if you want to add anything. Sure. Um, I would just say, you know, I think one of our biggest goals is maximizing the amount of limited time that we get with folks, right? Mm -hmm. and it, you know, until we reach 230,000 people on every engagement opportunity, there's still room to grow. So I think with every conversation we have after an engagement opportunity, I'm sorry, is someone scared about 230,000 no, comments? I'm right, I was <laughs> gesturing behind you. <clears throat> But I think that um, you know, with every every time we're out there in pop-ups, we're realizing, hey, you know, this didn't actually gain the reaction or maximize the amount of time with that one person because of this limiting factor. Being able to sit down with the team and take it line by line about like, you know, the strategy for flyers, the strategy for signs, the strategy for the places that we actually went to. You know, an example of that would be the budget 
we, we go out and engage every year. This year, um, we reached a little over 300 people in, um, during our pop-ups, but we immediately changed our course of action and applied what we had learned to our CIP process and reached 900 people that way. And I think it can grow even more. So um, I would say that continuous improvement is probably my most valued value that we listed earlier, and um, this is how we do that. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, thank you. Uh, I had two more things, but uh, one is uh, I do believe that uh, campaigns are, um, they have an amazing, a, a magical power. This is to uh, reaffirm the values of the community. Because when you do a campaign, for example, for, for, for uh, Vision Zero, et cetera, at the same time, you carry a different, a, a whole lot of uh, other, other things. You set the stage, you, you condition the dialogue. And I think this is a valuable uh, instrument to, to, uh, to explore. Uh, and third one, I've had these conversations with, um, with you guys for a very long time, whether we should consider uh, whether we should have in our public realm actually physical places where to, uh, uh, you know, put a poster. Uh, I do think that they are very powerful because they, you really, you know, bump into them. It's not anymore COVID. People are actually out there and they are, uh, you know, walking and, by, and cycling and even driving. And I think that this would be uh, worthwhile uh, to explore. We never did that here in Arlington. Uh, in cities where I've seen that, they are very successful, uh, in my opinion. So uh, I, we look I forward would be to exploring that with you. Okay. And the last one: What should we do better here? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Good question. How can we be supportive of you? Was that a real question? It is. <laughs> well, actually, I mean. Your support, your leadership. Um, I, we started the presentation with public engagement is a value. It's a value exchange. Every single board member values that exchange. So asking the right questions, keeping us on track, holding us accountable, that helps us. So thank you. Okay. Fantastic. Well, I hate to ask another question because what a note to end on that would be. <clears throat> um, one of the, the sort of ongoing tensions that I think is just inherent in communications and um, have been thinking about for a long time is that tension between um, breadth and depth. Um, you know, this came up, I think, uh, when we had really, by all intents and purposes, a complete count, right? Every housing unit responding to the census and heard from a couple of folks in our community saying, well, like, let, let's, what, let's do that for everything. <laughs> um, and I think one of the reasons that was so effective, and even to some extent that, you know, the um, the <clears throat> complete vaccination committee was pretty effective as well, um, not only because of all of the reasons that you described, all of the work of this team and the, the dedication of the folks um, who served, but that was such a specific action, right? And it was, it, was, it was reaching a lot of people to do something once, or maybe in the case of vaccination, then two more times, but um, you sort of a, a complete the, sen the census and then you've, you've done what we, we hoped this campaign would get you to do. Um, and it can be really challenging instead when we're trying to get people involved in very deep processes to really evaluate the trade-offs. Um, you know, the, the complete your census form is really different than, you know, please stay with the evolution of this sector plan over two years so you can help us understand whether to prioritize stormwater retention relative to other public facilities and setbacks versus stepbacks and so forth. Um, you know, Matt Matuzic, who is our, I think, our lead planner on um, the Pentagon City Sector Plan, really had a, uh, what I, an insight that landed with me that I've thought a lot about since, which was, you know, these are the circumstances, those really deep circumstances are the ones in which we almost definitionally have to rely on representatives because you cannot get, um, you know, hundreds of people in a room to, to really sort of meaningfully talk about those trade-offs. So that, that may be one answer, that sort of sense of representatives. Um, but I wonder how you or, or sort of the broader teams working within departments have thought about that trade-off and, um, you know, is there a way to kind of codify expectations for what a representative might do or, or other practices we might undertake when it comes time to go deep? Yeah, so I think there's campaigns like Complete Count and Vaccine and Vision Zero, you know, things that um, climate where, you know, we need everyone to take an action and there's things that everyone can do and then there's the sector plans um, and there's small projects and big projects. Um, we're really working hard, as I mentioned in the, in the guide, to align the engagement 
with the level of impact. Mm -hmm. who's, who's burden, who, who benefits, who's burden? How do we know who's missing? And then aligning, the, the higher the level of impact, positively or negatively, the more engagement, right? The more outreach. So that means that we have to be intentional sometimes about reaching the renters that live in that building right next door. It's intentionality. We're not gonna be able to do that for everything, but if we use the guide effectively, it allows us an alignment um, of breadth and depth, if yeah. that helps. I think it does. I don't know if these guys want to. <clears throat> so I, I, yeah. I don't know if that helps. It, no, it does. And I think you know, there's also that, just that question of um, knowing that folks in the community have limited bandwidth, right? Um, and so what does it mean to, and we've talked about this a lot in terms of how do you provide those supports, and you, you indicated in your presentation. Um, you know, around somebody who might care very deeply about the future of their community, but is not going to have the bandwidth to, you know, sit through um, 18 months of meetings on a sector plan steering group, right, for example. And that's where I think, you know, your point about coming back in, reminding people where we're at, mm -hmm. doing um, snapshots in time, you know, uh, making sure that when we're at a new point in engagement, we, we elevate the energy around that so that we can bring people in at that point. We do know that when it's in front of people, you know, sometimes it's not until the construction folks si show up, yeah. but that we're, that thread of communication throughout from beginning to end is so important that we, it doesn't end with the plan, but that we tie the project back to where the origin of the project, right? Mm -hmm. That people understand that there's been this journey and where we are in the journey. Um, so. I don't know if that answers your question, yeah, Katie. Yeah. I think it's um, it's one of those, the job is never done. Yeah. And um, right. it's a continuous improvement and uh, exploration. So thank yeah. you. Uh, sure. Um, well, thank you. And I think, uh, you know, one of those sort of internal organization things that has big impact on what people in the community experience is so on display here. Um, someone described, I think it was uh, Mr. Aiken actually used this from the other day, talking about the communication structure in the county is latticed, right? That you've got folks who are the subject matter experts working within your departments, but you also are interconnected in, um, uh, uh, and this has been a huge area of improvement that I've seen during my tenure on the board. You're interconnected to each other too. Um, and I think that delivers on the type of predictability that, that you were talking about, Dr. Halford, that, um, the expectation that community members do have and should have that when they participate in, um, you know, a, a master planning process for a park, um, that that shouldn't meaningfully differ from participating in a, I don't know, master planning process for the um, water pollution control plan, right? Um, it'll differ, of course, according to that continuum, that guideline, but, but the steps should be the same. The language should be the same. There should be consistency of outreach. Um, I, I know that wouldn't happen if this group did not have an identity, not only as members of your individual departments, but as a team with one another. Um, and so I really appreciate the, the work that, that's put in there, um, certainly on behalf of this group to, to steer, but also you all to, to sort of operate horizontally as well as vertically in your lattices. So appreciate you too. All right. I Thank think that concludes. Yeah, it's been a real pleasure. Thanks for the update. Okay, one more. Um, thank you, everybody. And it's so exciting to see everybody here. I can't believe our emergency management communicators and our planning communicators are sitting right next to each other. How did that happen? I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, uh, Madam Chair, you know, we talked last uh, in February and also last year in September about our ongoing work that we face in the commercial market. And I know that we're gonna be adopting the budget this evening. And I'm, I especially get reminded of this uh, when we're talking about the budget. We have um, a great community, and we rely to a very large degree on the success of our commercial sector. Um, and what we've gone through in the last two years has been, I think, unprecedented in the last, of what we've seen in the last 40 or 50 years. So um, you challenged us to uh, come back with uh, ideas about how to improve our market resiliency and um, what does that actually mean and how do we go about doing that given that um, our zoning ordinance is a product of uh, many decades ago and has some crusty old barnacles on it that need to be scraped off. Um, we've taken a number of runs at this, but what I, I wanna do today, and this is a, uh, a really been a joint work product between our planning and economic development staff, go through uh, some of our ideas about how to move us ahead and uh, I think a thoughtful and perhaps a quicker way than when we're 
we are uh, used to as a community. Um, and so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn it over to our planning director, uh, Anthony Fusarelli, and also um, the big dog in the red dog group. He can explain what that means, Mark McCauley, uh, for a presentation. Welcome, gentlemen. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Manager. Red Dog is real estate development group. It's not nearly as uh, exciting as it sounds, but uh, <laughs> thank you, uh, Board Chair Crystal, Vice Chair Dorsey, and members of the County Board for taking the time to talk with us this afternoon. We are excited to present to you today a proposed new approach to uh, promote commercial market resiliency in Arlington through land use regulation flexibility and responsiveness. What do we mean when we talk about commercial market resiliency? Well, these will be targeted efforts to support a robust, a robust commercial real estate market, including the continuation of our efforts to reduce our commercial office vacancy rate, and related to continue our balanced fiscal uh, outlook, where commercial real estate continues to contribute significantly to total counter revenues. We also see this as an important supporting our business, business community by encouraging innovation and entrepreneurship. These innovative business concepts will in turn continue to provide consumer choice that supports a strong and dynamic housing market, and will continue to, to contribute to maintaining and building great and sustainable places. Why is this an urgent need today? Well, really, it's about the pace of economic change and innovation that affects land use has quickened, quickened dramatically, particularly over the last several years with, with the pandemic. And this includes play, concepts like where and how we work, consumer behaviors and expectations, and business practice innovations. All this has changed what were once well-defined land uses. We, knew what, we, we once knew what was in an office building, what types of activities occurred in, the, in those buildings and how to retain and attract those uses. But the, as the economic model has changed and will continue to change, more dynamic planning and zoning strategies are needed in order for Arlington to compete regionally and nationally. As Mr. Fusarelli will also expound upon, this is not about a need to tear down and rebuild our planning and zoning rubric, that has successfully provided Arlington with a unique competitive position for the past several decades, but is about an important refitting of the ship, if you think of it in that way, as it enters deeper uncharted waters. How do we, how do we plan to define success and desired outcomes? Well, through the modernized land use regulations that can, that can accommodate desirable and emerging, emerging land uses, first, we provide more streamlined and predictable approval processes for new businesses. Investments by new businesses become very challenging to justify with significant regulatory uncertainty, especially entrepreneurs and small businesses where capital is constrained and risk of business failure is high. The more predictable businesses on the, on the other side of that coin will also allow landlords to take more risk in emerging and innovative uses. They'll be able to provide the spaces for those types of businesses. From a county workflow perspective, the more predictable process will also remove items that burden the county board agenda and take up significant staff resources. This will allow us to be more focused on more complex planning work that has the greatest potential impact. We started this discussion internally about land use flexibility with the discussion of what are the low hanging fruit? The uses that should and could be resolved more quickly with a predictable process. These types of uses were those that had the most urgency in terms of proven market demand but also that would have little or no identifiable impact outside of the building due to the nature and scale of the use, had already been approved in some parts of the county or in other jurisdictions, and or were minor tweaks to already approved uses in Arlington. The most compelling uses we have considered as staff worthy of being considered for low hang, as a low-hanging fruit are uses that were, as examples, would be uses that are just approved by the county board in November for ground floor commercial uses along Columbia Pike, such as animal boarding, breweries and distilleries, maker spaces and urban agriculture, changing use regulations to reflect the seismic shifts and how nearly all restaurants have incorporated food delivery into their primary business model, changing educational and university uses in office buildings from more time-consuming use permit process to by right designation, allowing for edge data centers, independent of the functioning of one building's technological needs, in order to support Arlington's broader technology infrastructure and smart city concepts. Micro fulfillment uses, where customers can benefit from real-time delivery of goods served by fulfillment centers in their own neighborhood. Specifically in this first phase of low-hanging fruit use, the types of micro fulfillment activity that can occur within a building and utilize non-auto modes of delivery, like bike and ped. And R&D spaces, where activities today 
considered industrial in our zoning ordinance, such as wet labs or robotic labs, can be allowed alongside traditional or open concept office uses, which is a market standard for how many emerging tech companies are using their built space and thus critical to our competitiveness. This list is not meant to be exhaustive, nor is it all low-hanging fruit can all happen immediately, but I do think uh, they are a, a good start to think about the types of uses our community may see and may actually uh, enjoy uh, to see uh, in, the in the near future. Mr. Fusso and I now walk through the details of the new planning approach, including how we parse and quickly react to future new uses and how we distinguish between uses that have different levels of complexity, as well as some near-term action that we propose to undertake. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. McCauley, and good afternoon, board members. Um, right on cue, uh, I am having technical difficulties, so I'm going to momentarily leave the mill meeting and return. <laughs> Virtually, not physically. Apologies for this, not sure um, what's causing the connection issue. This is, this is what's what we all right, all right, all right. We are here. We are back. Uh, I think, uh, think I'm connected, connected now. now. So, uh, mute myself. All right. And it appears to be loading. All right. Here we go again. Thank you for bearing with. Okay. Um, so it is against uh, this backdrop uh, that we are here this afternoon to share our latest thinking around proposed changes uh, to our pertinent uh, planning and zoning systems as Mr. Uh, McCauley introduced. Um, to be clear, I think this is important to reinforce, for decades, Arlington has had a land use and zoning system that has worked quite well uh, for our community in providing an implementable framework uh, for well-defined uses and in most cases, uh, very clear approval paths. But as was noted, uh, the world is changing and we must change with it and modernize our regulations, practices and processes so that as a community, we can be nimble enough to accommodate and welcome new and emerging uses where appropriate and in a timely fashion. At a general level, uh, we envision these proposed changes to be focused on four uh, broad categories of work uh, seen here involving how we address new uses in commercial businesses um, or expand in commercial buildings, excuse me, or also expanding existing permitted uses to other parts of Arlington, the internal and external processes associated with such uses, adjusting our approval paths for um, in, and entitlement types uh, to be best matched for the proposed use. And finally, a variety of other process changes, including updates to our standard site plan conditions and how we distinguish between major and minor site plan amendments in our zoning ordinance or other items to be administratively approved. And to say just a few words here about process, uh, we have also considered how to improve our approach to emerging uses as well. This begins with a well-defined, dedicated uh, response staff team who would play a key role in addressing business requests for certain uses and would also conduct uh, research on such uses at a starting point. Based on this research and other factors, our analysis would then involve a criteria-based decision on which type of process would be most appropriate to consider for that potential new use. And based on our conceptualization to date, the three categories uh, we've developed would um, involve studies that are either quick nimble or nuanced. Two important ways in which these three use study categories vary include the anticipated amount of time for study, as well as the order of the process involved, uh, uh, the process components involved in those studies. So processes for quick items are thought to be those no-brainers um, and nimble items where perhaps there are a few things to investigate would involve the same order and makeup of process components just with different timing 
So for both of these uh, types of studies, after initial analysis, staff would bring to the county board a request to advertise first before public engagement and then engage the planning commission and its zoning committee, the community at large, before bringing it back to a, uh, the county board for a hearing in action. We expect that quick items could generally take up to six months and nimble items might take up to nine. For the items that warrant the greatest degree of investigation and engagement, the nuanced items would be most akin to the processes we typically follow now. For those items, we'd conduct more robust engagement or outreach before advancing in advertisement and then go to the planning commission before returning to the county board, which we, may, we expect may take up to 12 months uh, on average. It's also possible that certain uses could be phased through different variations of study depending on the details of actually establishing or implementing the use. And to demonstrate this, we'll take microfulfillment as, as an example. In its least impactful form, microfulfillment could be envisioned as a use that repurposes portions of an underutilized parking garage or non-storefront portion of an existing building locally delivers most or all of its goods by non-motorized modes of transport. In this form, we'd see this as a quick use study. Now consider a similar use, but one that occupies a ground floor storefront space, or perhaps has increased expected impacts on the public right of way. This concept may call for a nimble use study. And finally, given the larger scale and essence of fulfillment activity, such as with larger deliveries associated with uh, large format grocery stores, this may involve more of a nuanced use study. The key point to note here is that we view this as an option for a parallel path that'd be available to address our permissions for new and emerging uses that could play an important role in our goals and objectives associated with commercial resiliency. In discussions to date, We've also identified several other potential uses depicted here that we would strive to address later in 2022 and moving into 2023 as well. So in closing, uh, I'll review our proposal to pilot this proposed approach with an emerging use of urban microfulfillment. We'll first be addressing the quick use study version of microfulfillment where such uses would occupy existing buildings uh, that are non storefront or garages um, and where most or all deliveries are made through non-motorized means. Our next steps, uh, after assigning staff to the study, we'd initiate research and analysis on the requested use. We would then bring forward to the county board, uh, we are targeting July, for a request to advertise, and then followed by engagement, uh, including with the zoning committee of the planning commission in September, and come back to planning commission and county board for hearings in October. Uh, consistent with the time frame shared earlier. And so um, with that, once we get started, it's important to note here that uh, as we um, initiate this work, if we find that the uh, studies can be completed, obviously in under six months, we would endeavor to do so. Um, so that concludes our staff presentation this afternoon. We'd be happy to answer any questions. Terrific. And as my colleagues gather their thoughts for questions, I just want to express my enthusiasm about this work. I think that it um, really picks up on uh, the expressed desire of the board and a number of our residents, in fact, that, it, that particularly began when we began to consider alternative uses or um, uh, rather amendments to the form-based code on Columbia Pike that might allow for different types of uses and whether that was um, dog boarding or um, cideries or meteries, which I think we uh, we quickly realized that there were quite a few areas where our zoning ordinance was the obstacle to a type of use uh, that not only the market was eager to supply, but that our residents and consumers were eager to avail themselves of. So I really appreciate these efforts uh, on behalf of staff to think about what this would look like countywide um, and how to be able to operate tactically to adjust to exactly as Mr. McCauley said, rapidly changing um, uh, economy and, and marketplace. So everyone's lights went on at the same time. I'm going to start with Ms. Garvey and uh, just make our way down here. Okay, fine. I think my light came on third, but that's okay. Oh, who's went on first? I think Matt's. Uh, go me. ahead. Okay. Uh, unless, shall I just, but it's probably simple to go around. I'm happy to do it. Um, thank you. Um, this is, you know, I think we've all been feeling for quite a while that this has been needed. It's kind of clear. I think it's maybe in a way a, a little bit of a, a gift of the pandemic 
you know, we sort of all knew this needed to happen and it sort of felt impossible and then suddenly everything closed down and we did TOSAs and you did, I mean, really it was impressive how, how, how quickly and um, you kind of were able to respond to some of that. So um, my question is just kind of basic and sort of a, uh, somebody who doesn't really think about, you know, I don't spend all my time on zoning, whatever. Six months doesn't feel like quick to me. Um, and and looking at the 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 on I think it's slide eight. I'm actually I'm not quite clear if it's seven or eight, but the one that has the analysis you've got quick goes down, and the staff analysis it looks like is going to take three and a half months, sort of if it's if that's the way you meant it to line up. Um, so that seems like the longest amount of time. Is there a way to speed up that part? At least really try to get four months doesn't actually feel really quick, but it feels like way better. Could we maybe try to do that on the pilot? Maybe even I don't know. What's 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 needed? What's or am I just missing something? No. Uh, um, thank you for the question. I think I think the. Uh, to answer your first question, I think the um, the way the graphic is depicted here, they're supposed to be conceptually, um, so exactly where those words fall relative to the spectrum. It, it's not intended to kind of communicate that that would be sort of the the timing of each of those incremental parts. Um, but I will I, you know will say that even um, in terms of that six month process, there is a number of things that staff would have to undertake and complete. Um, the, the analysis, you know, we have to conduct a certain level of analysis uh, to even prepare for the request to advertise. Um, and for something like urban micro-fulfillment that is, again, in an existing garage and not relying on motorized vehicles for transport, um, there is a little bit, there is some work associated with that. Uh, but we think, obviously, it's, it's a lot less than more of a intensive operation. Um, I, I do think that an important point to make about this proposed approach is the proposal to actually advertise up front before engagement. And when it comes to a zoning ordinance amendment, uh, that advertisement actually becomes really important in terms of setting the scope. And so if we advertise, ask the board to advertise something where the scope isn't quite fully developed or thought through, we, we do run the risk if as we proceed and advance our studies and engagement, we do run the risk of actually needing to re-advertise <coughs> if we decide to change something along the way. So that's part of the thinking is that we don't want to necessarily kind of shortchange ourselves on the time for the staff analysis because we, we want to try and leave no stone unturned to the extent we can within, within a timely fashion. So speaking just for myself, thank you, that's helpful. Um, so the risk is that you'd have to re-advertise and take longer. So if you got it at three, if you manage to get it down a lot faster and you don't manage to pull it off, we end up at the six months where you might have been anyway, possibly. You see what I'm saying? And it might be a risk worth, ta worth taking sometimes because if you do it okay and it, and, you, and it goes as well as you think, then we actually can do it quicker. So the worst thing that'll happen is you'll end up at the six months you thought you were gonna have to need in the first place. I, I don't know if that's the case, but that's what I'm sort of seeing might be a possibility. Um, so this board member, at least particularly while trying in a pilot, if we find we have to re-advertise something, um, I'm not going to be like angry at you guys for, you know, not catching something. Um, and, and that might be something that would happen with the pilot. I don't know. Um, so I guess I just a, a little bit of more, more risk there might be, might be worth it on, on some of these things, just sort of saying that speaking for myself, but I'm only one of five of us. Um, but I, I really am pleased that we're, we're trying to do this. It, it's sounding a little, it's reminding me a little bit of the um, presentation we just had where it's really about the impact. You know, if there's not a whole lot of impact, even if you kind of make, you know, we, we have to, it, we get it out there and if there's not a whole lot of impact, then it, maybe it doesn't require all that. Whereas if there's a whole lot of impact, I totally understand that you're going to need to take, take more time because if you make a mistake, it's a problem. I guess it's a whole risk analysis is maybe what it is. So, so thank you. That's thank the, you. my question for now. Thanks, Mr. Franti. Um, a thank you to the manager, and I think it was, I don't know whether it was the chair, but this is not an issue that I had seen as as fully as you all had seen. And, and also thank you for the work quickly, and uh, this is great. Um, this is just gonna be a comment that's a thought. The uses, uh, I think this is the scope of what the work was, is the uses are primarily ground floor. 
and and I think we have this other office issue that's out there, and uh, I will. You guys can share if you want, but I'll be happy to loop back. I know that work is happening. I just think that there's some concepts on the full office that um, we have a lot of um, spin-off businesses that are likely to happen in the next few years. Uh, there's a couple of ways in which I, I, you know, getting from 20 down to 14 is going to take some work. Um, I think some will happen, but some there'll be some work. So that's you know, in the interest of time, I'm just sort of flagging, that's my biggest thought. This work seems great to me, and I'm just, thanks to you and and uh, yeah. our chair leadership and, and vice chair, I believe, and because I, I haven't been following, but it's the right work to be doing, and big thank you to the two of you as well. And, and just to clarify, um, Board Member DeFranchi, these are about upper floor uses as well. I think Columbia Pike was focused on the ground floor because that was the focus of that study. But a lot of those uses could be upper floor and things like uh, flex R&D lab spaces is absolutely about filling office space. Urban agriculture may be feeling about filling office space. Education University is about filling office space. So we are as focused not just on ground floor, but on the commercial vacancy rate, commercial office vacancy rate as well with these new uses. And I. I, knew, I saw the data, I, I know that, but I think you might also acknowledge that in addition to what's here, there's some more office thinking too. Absolutely, and I think this process allows us to continue to react to those opportunities and quickly get through the process. Thank you. Thank you both, thank you. Okay, was our economic development director, Mr. Tucker, looking to get in on that? I thought I saw a flashing icon there. Okay, I wasn't sure. anything, anything to add? No, I think the staff has covered it, thank you. <laughs> okay, fantastic. <laughs> <clears throat> and I'll just clarify that uh, I, I personally deserve no credit for it. I think this is uh, really a, uh, on the initiative of our manager and really the recognition of both our planning and economic development teams for, for this opportunity. So, Mr. Dorsey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes. And, uh, you know, it, it, credit does go to Mr. Schwartz for, you know, managing us through a pandemic, but also having his eye on the prize for a potential existential crisis looming. And so your ability to multitask and walk and chew gum at the same time just is one other reason why we're, we're pleased to have your, your leadership of, of our county government. With that, um, you know, this is just really great work. And, you know, I think responsive to things that we have specifically or implicitly been asking for for quite a while. And I think it, it is also the culmination of a lot of work that we're doing and thinking about you know, equity and remediating past or historic or legacy uh, choices, none of which are necessarily bad per se, but just not necessarily suited for our modern times and environment. And you know, this very much gets at you know, some of the criticisms of Euclidean zoning, which has been, you know, predominant paradigm for about 100 years. And, you know, when we think about what zoning is, is attempting to do and designed to do to make sure that um, we have development compatible with infrastructure so that development doesn't overwhelm infrastructure, that we can, you know, curb externalities that come from whatever use might be in order and that we can develop or maintain a, a community character when you think about all those reasons for why we kind of have review and impediments for activity, um, you know, I think this work really highlights that when those concerns are either not a part of the proposed use or addressed by the proposed use, we absolutely should permit it and, and therefore we should also be able to get to saying yes as quickly as possible because if it's not doing those bad things that zoning is intending to prevent, what in the world are we waiting for? And, you know, these, these areas of, of low-hanging fruit, you know, I'm, I'm excited about all of them, but I also see the flex R&D and lab spaces as a particular area that could be a growth or could be an area of opportunity for Arlington to reduce the commercial vacancy rate. Uh, had the privilege of exploring a lot of these types of spaces throughout the region. And I mean, they, they are as compatible with an office use as any of the million and one uses that we have going on right now. And uh, that that's a difficult path for people to do in a community like Arlington is, is, is a pox on us, given the kind of um, tech hub that we're, we're building. In this community, those uses ought to be facilitated. So I see that as an area of great, 
great opportunity and uh, those exist very well within mixed environments or could provide opportunities for people to uh, you know, take over whole office buildings um, in, in the future to do some pretty amazing things and be located close to, to the talent that is probably um, you know, working there or would be attracted to working there. So anyway, I think this is, this is great work that can lead to even greater things than we're, we're indicating by our conversation today and applaud you on it and am very supportive. And, and Ms. Garvey, while I appreciate that you would like to see quicker, I think, look, wherever you can, go quicker, but four months would still be great compared to the, st six months would still be great compared to the status quo. So I'm, I'm with you. I'd love it to be as quickly as possible, but I'm, I'm not going to, uh, to shy away from going. Six months is, is really good, too. I'm just getting a chunk of time and trying to take a little bit more <laughs> <There we laughs> if go. I can. There we go. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Madam Thanks Chair. Thank you so much, Mr. Rossi. <clears throat> Mr. Uh, Gertonis. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, scraping the barnacles, that's a very healthy practice from time to time. Yeah. I mean, there is no worse thing than a uh, boat with a lot of barnacles underneath. That's, that's really a, a nightmare. So um, thank you for that. I, one of the innovations that you're proposing, I find absolutely you know, very intriguing. This is a scout team. So people who will be on staff, uh, who will be actually investigating, uh, you know, new new uses and uh, preparing, right? So I would like, I mean, I believe that this will be uh, probably the best accelerator. We, we will understand a lot, a lot of things before they, uh, actually somebody comes with a proposal here and we will be ready to receive that, right? Um, which means we will be opening, or we'll be putting a, a big, a big sign that says, "We are open for business. Here, here's where you can start." And, and I think this is great. So, two questions. One is um, uh, how exactly this will work. So, how the how are they going to scout and and find? And the second thing is, what else are we going to do on the AD side? Um, I've seen uh, this uh, flexibilization, so this scraping of barnacles always going hand, hand in hand with something else. Like, for example, and here you have a, uh, you know, a financial support program, and here you have, uh, you know, certain things where we, we would be focusing on that. A, a big example for me, uh, something I, I feel very strong about, is kind of mentioned here. It's probably between nimble and nuanced. Uh, it's uh, um, urban manufacturing. So uh, uh, that's, that I'm trying to understand whether we will be doing that as well. So um, thank you for the question. I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, try to address the first, the first question and then maybe turn it to Mr. McCauley for the second. But um, yeah, I mean, in a way, this slide depicts, I think, the creation of a new team that already exists in some way. So uh, it just, the intent here is really to formalize and improve um, the staff we bring together to respond to um, requests that either um, Arlington Economic Development might, might receive as sort of the first entry point or CPHD planning might receive. I think um, we, we already do that. I think what we've learned through our conversations over the past few months is um, we really should be including uh, some of our colleagues and partners in other agencies within our departments and perhaps elsewhere um, as part of that initial response, because we might, while we might be looking at it from an economic development and a planning perspective, there may be zoning nuances, there may be you know building code nuances that really we should have the benefit of that knowledge um, and insight going in. So um, I think taking sort of the informal team we currently have and, and expanding it and making it a bit more formal is really the intent of, of what's there. But um, yeah, for the second question. I'll turn it over to Mark. Yeah, I think in terms of how our business investment group in particular goes out and finds prospects, I think we always, uh, from my side of, of, of that department, we always talk about them being unencumbered. Go find the prospects and we'll figure out how to get it done. This is just an easier way to get it done. And I think it's an easier way for them to go out and find prospects and look them straight in the face and say, we have a process to get you there versus, versus the unknown, the uncertainty, right? So I think, I think part of this process, and it showed up in the slide, is not only, as Anthony referenced, sort of really formalizing who, what staff is ready to respond quickly to these, but also 
not only responding to business requests, but going out there and do the research and bringing in our business investment team and sort of saying, you were just out in San Diego on a prospect trip. What did you see out there? And what was the cool stuff you saw? And let's get ahead of that before business has to ask us because that, that may, we can get it done before the business comes in and asks us because you can go out there. So I think that process of research and discovery is also a critical part of this when usually we've asked those folks to go out there, find the right prospects, and then we have to then figure out how to get it done. So I think that's part of the approach that is, it's a, it's a, it's a slightly, it's, it's not a major shift, it's really just about more of a focus and more of a formalization of that process. Yeah. Thank you. I always re, uh, remember the questions like, where can I, where can I do this or the other? Show me where. So. No, it's terrific. And Mr. McCauley, what a note to end on too. I mean, I think you've really described what this means for our economic development. <clears throat> recruitment practices, um, which is exciting. And, and again, you know, just, just emphasize, uh, this is not just for shoring up, you know, our, our office vacancy rate in commercial sector. This is also because, you know, many of these are uses that our residents are really interested in, right? Whether it's pursuing, um, you know, a new certification or higher education in a, in a way that's close to their home or um, taking advantage of urban agriculture, whatever else the case may be. So um, I think this is really exciting for both our um, commercial uh, uh, market, but also for, um, Arlingtonians as consumers. I think this is going to yield uh, a lot of enthusiasm. Um, so thank you so much for this work. I think you, from what I'm hearing, you have the uh, the strong support from the board when the only feedback you get is go faster, then you, you know you're headed in the right direction. So um, thank you so much. And Mr. Manager, does that conclude your report for us today? That concludes my presentation. Thank you. Okay, fantastic. We have a couple of items to consider in a closed session. So I am going to move that the county board convene a closed meeting as authorized by Virginia Code Sections 2.237.11a.3 and 8 for two discussions regarding the acquisition of and disposition of real property for public purpose where discussion of an open meeting in an open meeting would adversely affect the bargaining position or the negotiating strategy of the public body and for a discussion with the county attorney regarding case number CL22-1290 currently pending in the Arlington County Circuit Court. To, that's been seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Great. We are um, recessed, I, or rather we are enclosed. Um, we will return no earlier than 6.30 p.m. Thanks so much.
uh, as our first item of business, I'm going to reconvene us into our open meeting by moving that the members of the county board certify at the just concluded closed session. First, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements under Chapter 37, Title 2.2 of the Code of Virginia, and two only such public business matters as were identified in the motion by which the closed meeting was convened were heard, discussed, or considered by the board. It's been seconded. Our clerk will now call the roll. Yes, of course. Uh, Ms. Crystal? Yes. Mr. Dorsey? Yes. Mr. DeFranti? Yes. Mr. Carantonis? Yes. And Ms. Garvey? We'll hold the vote open for her. We'll yeah, vote. great. Thank you so much. Okay, um, welcome back. Uh, we had no items pulled from our consent agenda uh, on Saturday, so we are going to move forward with the first regular item. And uh, Mr. Kushner, could you call that item, please? Of course, uh, items number 42A through P are related to the fiscal year 2023 proposed operating budget, tax rates, and various fees. Uh, as a note to the public, the public comment period for this item is concluded and discussion is with the board. Thank you very much. Um, I do believe, however, we have a brief staff presentation from the manager, is that right, or no? It is solely with the board. Um, okay, uh, in that event, Ms. Garvey is going to join us. I hate to just launch into it without her. Um, okay, why don't we do this? Before we begin making motions, um, I think it would be appropriate for us to um, uh, put uh, on the table the guidance that the board members have considered adopting along with this budget. Um, and so, Mr. Kushner, if you could pull that up for us, please. Excellent. Okay, thank you so much. Um, okay, so uh, certainly everybody who uh, joined us on Thursday knows that we have um, a, a near complete markup, although I will be making one motion to further amend it um, in introducing that item. Um, and we alluded to the fact that we are going to have some guidance accompanying um, uh, that uh, adopted budget, um, which is generally our custom. This is an opportunity for us to express um, the will of the board, our uh, direction to the manager and staff in general um, to accompany those allocations. Uh, Generally speaking, they are indeed about allocations, but in a few cases, they're also about priorities that we have for the year ahead. Um, so I am uh, going to, for purposes of discussion, move the guidance before us. If I have a second, great, that's been seconded. I'm going to propose that we work our way through it. I'll call on colleagues um, to speak specifically to some of the items on which you have been working. Um, I'll begin with just two points regarding compensation, which of course has been uh, the overall theme of this budget. Um, the first is an allocation of half a million dollars, 500,000 in one time money to be appropriated under the manager's authority to develop targeted bonuses and recruitment incentives for general employees and hard to fill positions throughout the enterprise. Um, one of the things we have, of course, talked about um, throughout this budget is the recognition that um, while frontline workers uh, are often in public safety, they are by no means exclusively there. And from um, water sewer streets to mental health counselors, we have positions um, where folks have endured a great amount of stress during the pandemic and uh, the high number of vacancies uh, indeed reflect that stress. Um, so although we do not are not able to uh, get into the mechanics of the pay plan enough to manipulate individual salaries with different increases, um, we are very much expecting the manager um, to use his expertise um, to develop a plan for amounts and uses of about half a million, or of half a million dollars in incentive funds and come back to us on July 1st um, with his plans for using those funds um, and assessing their efficacy, which is also really important to make sure that they're working. Um, this, I, I have July 1st, First, as an opportunity for um, an update from the manager, we recognize that, that um, the full determination um, may not be uh, made about the right places to invest that until later in the fiscal year, but with the expectation that that would be done during the first half of the fiscal year. Um, there is another item regarding uh, compensation. This is something that came up throughout our conversations, certainly our work sessions, um, which is a recognition of the fact that there are um, pretty dramatically shifting employee preferences um, when it comes to where employment is going. Um, that historically, Arlington has really led the region, um, either by policy or simply the reality that we don't participate in the Virginia retirement system like some of our peer jurisdictions do. But generally, Arlington has led the region and been the most competitive in terms of the most um, generous post-employment benefits. Um, but as we saw from the Human Resources Department during our budget work session, we are not always the most competitive with components 
of uh, sort of uh, within workforce years uh, benefits. And we would like the opportunity or we'd like the, the manager to explore the opportunity to evaluate whether the basket of benefits um, is as competitive as we need to attract and retain um, the workforce uh, you know, of, of current and rising generations. Um, uh, this is, of course, going forward, I should emphasize, <laughs> um, rather than proposing uh, uh, to, to, to make changes um, uh, to employees who maybe are near retirement, for example. Um, in short, this is an opportunity, or we are at, we would be asking the manager to to start this conversation with employee representatives where applicable, and engaging employee rep perspectives in general. Um, this is simply suggesting that the board uh, supports this line of discussion, not to prejudge any particular outcome. Um, so moving on, uh, the the next item is one-time relief for frontline human services nonprofits. Mr. DeFrandi, would you like to speak to this part of guidance? Sure. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, we had a little discussion on Thursday about this. Um, uh, there is the the this is driven by a, a sort of a, a related recognition that human services nonprofits ha have in some ways been doing frontline response, and the effort is uh, to pattern after Grant 2.0, where there's a desire that both those nonprofits with a majority of their services and that are focused on human service needs. Um, who already have relation, grant or relationships or contract relationships with the county would be eligible, um, but also those who do not, because we know that the that we have ongoing work and to sort of systematize our, our approach. And so um, what I would note about this is that um, grant, uh, this is something that we will continue to work with our Department of Human Services, Deputy County Manager, uh, on and it would come the grant criteria award and notice of funding availability first quarter of 2023, but we anticipate being in, in, in contact with our staff expertise as they develop criteria. Uh, and eventually this will have to, the decisions on the final awards that have met the threshold would have to come back uh, to the board. So I really appreciate uh, the work uh, open. I know there was discussion on Thursday, but appreciate the work that staff has done, as well as you, Madam Chair, to, to come to this. I think this is a, a sort of a, a targeted approach of one-time funding that uh, I hope will help us as we move from move fully into um, budget recovery. We have obviously our economy has been recovering, but we still have some challenges, and that's what led to this language. Thanks. And I, I don't know if you'd like to speak first to the second, to the next item, um, which is also something I know you've been uh, passionate about. Sure, and and um, this is this is um, we had a request, um, and we've done some thinking about um, the need for analysis of uh, substance abuse recovery um, and medical expertise to make sure that we're doing everything we can in in our jail and our detention center um, to uh, to make sure that we're protecting. Um, those who are in the jail and the, are the inmates who are there and the, the individuals there. So this is essentially trying to provide medical expertise and there's, um, it would be collaboratively, we have touched base uh, with the Sheriff's Office in addition to the Police Department and the Department of Human Services. Um, so this is an effort to follow up, make sure we're evaluating with that medical expertise that um, our community has shared with us, but we have also uh, worked on this issue, and we think this is a, a good one-time analysis. Um, I think there's some initial work that's already started, so there's possibility um, for um, achieving this goal of medical expertise, but also doing it uh, in an efficient way. So that's the proposal. Thanks. Thank you so much. I think we're all looking forward to seeing the results of um, that analysis, because I think we certainly share a desire, along with the sheriff, to improve where possible. Um, there's a little more guidance to follow if I can encourage, yeah, a little scrolling down. Um, and again, this is, it's been a busy budget process for you too. I'm going to turn to you to speak to these. Sure. Um, this uh, is a, also one-time funding. It's a strategic funding pool um, seeking to ad address. We've, we've um, heard, from, heard and engaged with our partnerships. Um, and uh, as, we, as we're moving out of this uh, difficult economic time, there's our staff has worked on this, and I appreciate the time and effort of our deputy county manager, uh, Ms. Flanagan Watson, who's, who's worked on this. Um, I will point to the, the sentence that includes the three different options, 
uh, call that to the attention of colleagues. Um, I'm particularly interested in uh, myself in potential grant matching pro matching funding because we know we want to build that uh, capacity of our partnerships to to uh, raise re raise funding uh, independently, and so this this is uh, language that seeks to accomplish that goal. It is one time. I uh, want to really stress that. Uh, I'm mindful that um, the language uh, of this is what staff has worked on and we have worked together on. Um, it might not be every comma and, and every phrase not, might not be how any one person might do it, but we've worked collaboratively uh, to develop this language and uh, I see this as a way um, to move our partnerships forward uh, as, they, as we work with them uh, to build capacity and strengthen uh, the, the three different um, focal points of the Columbia Pike Partnership, Clarendon Alliance, and Langston Boulevard. Um, so appreciate the chance to move this forward. There's also, um, I'll just touch on the other one below, um, which is because we're having such a significant public engagement piece of our work on Langston Boulevard with the Langston Boulevard uh, plan. There's uh, staff brought this forward and very much appreciate it as a way to uh, encourage that engagement and a value add that um, perhaps the Langston Boulevard Alliance is uniquely um, best positioned to do at this time. So that's the uh, latter of those two paragraphs. Thanks. Thank you. Excellent. Appreciate that, Mr. DeFranti. And I appreciate the um, effort on the latter, too, to reflect that, that this is an example of a community partner doing work better than staff could potentially. And so an opportunity for partnership is apt. Um, uh, the tree canopy study as well. I know you spoke to when we when we um, did markup on Thursday, and I appreciated your uh, articulation of the expectations there. Right, that this is funding um, to potentially uh, advance up the work of a tree canopy study, but again would not begin until after the completion of the forestry natural resources plan. So we really would be looking at the latter half of fiscal 2023. Um, and then the final item of guidance, I'm going to turn to Ms. Garvey to describe as well. Thank you. It's the support for the developmentally disabled population. Um, and I think all of us have been aware of the difficulties that this population and their families have had during COVID. Everybody's had a hard time, but they've had a particularly difficult time and already deal with difficult situations. Um, you know, and we, I think, have talked a lot about issues with transportation. Certainly there's some issues there, but in kind of exploring it with our staff more, they said, well, some of it's transportation, but if we could have programs closer to home and they weren't so far away, we wouldn't have this transportation problem and it actually would serve folks better. Um, so I've, um, we've got here allocating 250000 in one-time funding um, to support some some programs and and pilots for this um, for this community, um, and we haven't got all again all the all the details worked out. But the um, the different areas where they're looking at is uh, reopening day programs here and, and expanding those, um, and planning and exploration to develop new and as I said expanded day programs, um, and then also looking at the transportation issue, which um, possibly may cross over because I, a number of our uh, our folks who uh, have trouble getting around um, and are differently able to have having issues with transportation. So hopefully this will make life better for a number of folks who have a tough time often. Thank you so much. Okay, so I think um, uh, that has been uh, moved, seconded, and described, and we can open the floor for some conversation. I think Mr. Dorsey, questions or comments? <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair, and I appreciate the work of all colleagues for working on uh, this level of direction. Uh, Mr. Kushner, if you can just scroll back up to uh, the strategic partnerships piece, and Mr. DeFranti, I appreciate, uh, appreciate your description of this. I have to say that one thing I have a little bit of trouble with is the, the very last sentence. Um, while I completely appreciate the intent here, that's good guidance always for the use of one-time funds. The, the nature of uh, nonprofit organizations uh, may be that some of these deliverables that we've described or alluded to in one, two, and three are gonna best be accomplished by existing staff with a different allocation of their time spent on a particular project. And I'm not sure that this particular sentence marries with the way a nonprofit can best flexibly uh, fulfill what might be their proposal to partner with the county. And if taken literally and precisely, could lead people to proposing projects that are <clears throat> entirely stood up and run by consultants even if that's not necessarily the most efficient. So as this goes on, I'm not looking to wordsmith here from the dais, but hopefully we can engage in a 
uh, conversation to ensure that what we're really focused on are the deliverables in one, two, and three versus the specific way a nonprofit may creatively go about fulfilling it. That's all. Um, I'll just, I share the sentiment and, and uh, um, I, in the spirit of trying to, to move this forward, uh, I, um, I, I sort of said, you know, we might pass. But if the focus is on outcomes, I think you have a, a strong argument. And so uh, I just was in place because this is one time and because we want to be careful, I did not feel I wanted to uh, staff, and, and there's fair legitimate concerns that other board members, uh, others have. And so I didn't feel like I wanted to push too much, but I just have to just be honest that I share the sentiment fully. So. Um, well, uh, I mean, if I may add, uh, there is a lot of flexibility already built in point three of the matching, of the matching funding, uh, where, you know, basically we support their fundraising and that the, the proceeds of the fundraising they can, they can, you know, use as they, as they, as they need. So that, that's what I would have done. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, I, to me, there's there's no um, specificity around an anti-supplantation clause, for example, in these. I, I don't think there's um, a prohibition on nonprofits creatively working in their budgets to put resources where they need to. I think it's just clarifying that this one-time strategic funding pool should be about projects um, and not permanent personnel. I, I appreciate that. But, you know, if, for example, someone wanted to pursue three, um, by allocating the time of their existing uh, resource development individual uh, taken literally, that's not, a, that's not advised by this guidance. And I, I just don't think that we need to be in that level of engagement with how they operate there. Sure. I, it also is permanent personnel. I, mean, I think you could easily make the case that that individual is for the duration of the project, uh, working on that project. And you can supplant some of the funding for their time appropriately. Okay, if that's what you intend, that's not how some this people is, so may again, read This that. is in consultation with our staff who are going to be the ones actually executing it. Uh, so I, I think that the, um, that to me uh, suggests that there's consistency of expectation among those who've helped author this and those who will be fulfilling at, the grant program. At least one out of three doesn't have permanent pers personnel. <laughs> so that? one out of these three recipients doesn't have permanent personnel to begin with. So what do you mean? Uh, I'm sorry. Clarion Alliance doesn't yeah. have permanent personnel right now. If there's a desire to, to uh, move there's to amend the, to the yeah, right, right. But, if there's a desire to uh, move the, that that be struck from the guidance, we can accept that and take a vote. No, like I, like I said, I'm not looking to wordsmith okay. here at this time. I'm just hoping as we discuss with nonprofits, we have an interpretation that allows their best ideas to come forth as opposed to a literal uh, reading of the last line, which could be a little bit restraining towards their best ideas that they would propose. I think it's very important to establish clear expectations about what this funding is and isn't because um, it is not hypothetical. It is uh, absolutely the case that this board has allocated one-time funding that has been used for personnel in the past, which puts our nonprofits in a challenge, our partnerships in a challenging position, and this board in a challenging position the following fiscal year when that one-time money is not incorporated in the manager's recommendation and it's perceived as a cut that means they're gonna have to shed personnel. So I think the goal of being very clear about the expectations for this possibly supersedes uh, any restrictiveness uh, that could be interpreted from it. So with that, Madam Chair, I, again, I, I, I think this is a collegial disagreement, but are you concerned about permanent personnel increases? The, the addition of new personnel yeah. staff on the basis yeah. of one-time money? Yeah. If the reliance to fund those folks, uh, if the reliance to fund those personnel is on these dollars, then yes, I am concerned about that. Okay, so I, 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 not to be, I just want to be very clear here with what a nonprofit can propose to us to meet the spirit of this guidance. So if a, non, if a partner wants to pursue an arrangement, and I'll just use example number three, and they want to utilize the time of their incumbent development director, is that allowed? I don't, I don't know the level of specificity that our staff is proposing here in these agreements and whether there are going to be um, requirements for 
project budgets that are broken down into allocations of hours or not. I think they have the flexibility to determine that. Okay, so we but, just- But yes, I do think, let me say it this way, from my, from my perspective, if an organization wants to come forward and say, we'd like to hire a fundraiser and we'd like to use $60,000 from the county to hire a fundraiser, that is concerning to me, yes. Understood. But my question was about an incumbent de development director. I think we, it's probably time to let this one go. So I'm either going to let you propose an amendment or... <laughs> I, I don't need an amendment, but I'm trying to understand exactly what you're concerned with. And if it's new permanent personnel, I, I think we can insert the word new. Otherwise, I think this conversation is going to be instructive for staff as they engage with nonprofits to really assess the spirit of what, to assess exactly what they're proposing as opposed to its strict adherence to that, if that one sentence. If there is not a plan to pay that, that percent of the personnel's salary, there was not one before and there is not one after this grant for one year to pay that part of the personnel salary. That is my area of concern. Understood. That's not exactly what this says, so hopefully staff can take this conversation and apply it to the scrutiny of so whatever too. is proposed. And, and we certainly are uh, at their disposal to continue the conversation as needed. All right, anything further? Um, Mr. Karen, is anything further oh, on no, other no. items? Okay, great. Um, so with that, I believe that we are ready um, for a vote on this item, um, or excuse me, rather on the accompanying oh, okay. guidance. Oh, please, uh, if, Mr. if we have still, the, on the tree canopy appropriation, oh, first of all, something that I want to clarify on the $650,000 that we uh, want to make available uh, for a uh, similarly to grant 2.2 program appropriation, uh, does this mean that uh, in the Grant 2.0 program, uh, we have been providing exactly the same amount to each applicant? Will this be the case here as well? So um, uh, on that one, I think it's a great question. I, I myself uh, think that, you know, we don't want to get into fine tuning, but I could envision a, a, a level we have very different sized nonprofits. And so I think it's a reasonable question. For me, uh, it, uh, you know, a very s small budget nonprofit, uh, if there are 15 different places that qualify, I would want staff to have the flexibility to, to not have precisely the same dollar amount. That's my view, but I'm not sure whether there's other colleagues have strong, the language does certainly insinuate that it would be the same, precisely the same dollar amount. Similarly, and, and similarly, not, not exactly Yeah, that. for me, I would want, uh, I don't know, I think staff is best positioned to write the final guidance, but I would want at least some discretion for some variability. And that may not be, you know, the, the language, uh, colleagues may have different views, but that's my view. And I don't think it should be strictly done based on budget or, you know, I don't know what the appropriate criteria would be but I, the part of the spirit of this is brought um, because of my, a little bit the view that we have had a unique combination of cir circumstances the last three years that merits this one-time relief. That would be the pandemic and also um, some inflationary pressures. So the thought would be that there would be variability, but I think you have, have a very reasonable question. Okay. Uh, the second question is rather technical. It goes on the tree canopy study. We would procure in the language here to specify uh, which technology to to use, which is lidar technology. It is it is literally explicitly mentioned. Uh, was that the staff's recommendation that it makes sense to do that this way? On this one, I Wait. spoke at Arbor Day, but. I do not have tree expertise on this one. This is really staff driven. It's in consultation with uh, Ms. Rudolph and Department of Parks and Rec, and I think Vincent as well. Okay, the reason why I mentioned that, and I'm, I'm fine with this, the reason why I mentioned that is that there are some other, you know, alternative technologies we have been doing, we have been working on, and, uh, you know, using LiDAR technology to do the previous tree canopy studies, and this is a, it's a, you know, it's pretty, Good technology to do that. The uh, the problem is that uh, it's an enor it's an enormous data set that comes always out of that, and it's difficult to digest. 
So it takes a little bit. If we are in a hurry, leather is not the only answer, so, it's, so to say. It's the best. It's the Mercedes, but not the Anyway, if this is the recommendation, I'm fine to, to defer to staff on this, and I can imagine that we can modify there uh, if, if things change. Thank you. I, just because of, there's a lot of guidance, I think it's appropriate to to thank Ms. Cowan, who worked with me on a lot of the language for this and brought everybody together, including the tree canopy studies. So uh, that was very helpful. Thanks. Thanks. OK, great. All right, unless there are any other um, <clears throat> amendments or items for discussion, I believe that we are ready for a vote on the guidance to accompany the budget. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? OK, that carries unanimously. Um, a quick bit of business, Ms. Garvey, we had just held open the vote on closed session. If you could give the clerk your vote. No worries. Sorry. Do, do you vote yes on certifying the closed I, session? I do vote yes, <laughs> if that's the question. I Excellent. do. Yeah. Thank you. OK, um, so with that said, I believe that we are ready to move into a series of um, motions uh, to effectuate the budget, as well as a number of rates, tax rates, fee rates, et cetera. Um, the first item is to uh, move the fiscal year 2023 county budget resolution and appropriations resolution and the fiscal 2023 year appropriations by adopting the fiscal 2023 county budget resolution shown in the staff report as attachment one with one amendment that I will speak to briefly and further adopt the fiscal year 2023 county appropriations resolution attached to the staff report as attachment two, and further authorize the county manager to negotiate and sign grant agreements with nonprofits that result from fiscal 2023 budget appropriations subject to approval by form as by the county attorney. Um, with that, I'd like to make one amendment um, to uh, our markup from Thursday. Um, it was my intent at the conclusion of our markup to move um, the remaining balances that had been uh, uh, balanced, I guess, is after all of our ads in the category of contingencies um, or contingent um, to land acquisition. So that would be, um, again, essentially this motion proposes to adopt um, uh, the markup agreed upon on Thursday with the addition of moving 1.752, $1,776 from contingent to land acquisition. Do you have a second? Second, second? second. Great, thank you. Any discussion on that? All right, seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that carries unanimously. Our next item is item B, and I move that we adopt a calendar year 2022 based real estate tax rate of $1.13 so excuse me, one dollar and one point three cents for one hundred dollars of assessed value using the advertisement shown in the staff report as attachment one. That we further adopt the calendar year twenty twenty two commercial real estate tax rate for transportation initiatives at the current tax rate of uh, uh, twelve point five cents per one hundred dollars using the advertisement shown in the staff report as attachment one, and further adopt this calendar year twenty twenty two sanitary district tax for stormwater management at the current rate of one point seven cents per one hundred dollars of assessed value using the resolution shown in the staff report as attachment one. Second. Okay. Any discussion on that item, Mr. Carrington? No. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that carries unanimously. Um, and uh, I also move further that we adopt a calendar year 2022 general personal property tax rate of $5 per $100 of assessed value using the resolution shown in the staff report and a personal property tax of $1 and 1.3 per $100 of assessed value to public service corporations using the attached resolution. I further recommend that we adopt the resolution that is shown in the staff report concurring that the Commissioner of the Revenue should use an assessment ratio of 88% for calendar year 2022 personal property tax assessments for the classification of, cert of certain vehicles and that um, finally we adopt a calendar year 2022 resolution setting that the methodology should be utilized that the methodology that shall be utilized in distributing the state's block grants, including additional relief provided to qualifying clean view vehicles, fuel vehicles at 50% of the tax bill from $3,001 to $20,000 of the value, and the additional relief provided to qualifying vehicles equipped to transport the disabled, 50% of the tax bill from $3,001 to $20,000 of value. Do I have a second? Second. Um, and that complicated amendment serves to effectuate what we discussed on Thursday, which is the relief that we are proposing um, in its form to, uh, of, of a reduced assessment um, ratio 
um, uh, to, to offer some relief from the instability and spikes in the uh, car valuation market, um, which will be explained to those who uh, receive their bills later in the year. Yeah, Ms. and this, this is great. One question I, I recollect, I think because it says calendar year, we're going to have to take this up again before we get to our next budget, correct? Yes, thank yeah. you for just, specifying. Just so letting people know exactly. that. Exactly, yeah. yeah, thank you. So that that resolution that assesses the personal property tax at an 88% assessment ratio will expire at the end of the calendar year. So um, we will need to revisit this issue during the fiscal 2024 deliberations um, if the vehicle market remains as inflationary as it's been. So thank you, it's a good clarification. Okay, um, unless there's any further discussion. Oh, Mr. DeFranti. Just so I understand, the way we have done in the past, We'll adopt each of the subparts and then at the end discuss the budget as a whole. You got Thank it, you. exactly. Thank you. Yeah. Um, all right, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that carries unanimously. Um, for a motion regarding, series of motions regarding our business improvement districts, I'm going to turn to Mr. Dorsey. Thank you, Madam Chair. So uh, I'd like to move uh, items 42D, E, and F. They are the calendar year 2022 tax rates for the Boston Business Improvement District, the National Landing Business Improvement District, and the Roslyn Business Improvement District. Those rates are set at uh, four and a half cents per $100 of assessed value for Boston, 4.3 cents per $100 of assessed value for National Landing, and 7.8 cents per $100 of assessed value for Roslyn. Great, that's been moved and seconded, and Lisa, there's Mr. Cantona's no. discussion? No. no. Okay, in that event, all of those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, those carry unanimously. Um, and regarding the household solid waste rate, I will again turn to Mr. Dorsey for a motion. Okay, and I would like to move that the county board adopt a, uh, that we adopt a proposed amendment to chapter 10, article one of the code of Arlington County uh, to, uh, increase, I'm sorry, to decrease the household solid waste rate from $318.61 to $307.89, which is a net reduction of $10.72. Second. Great. Any discussion? No. All right. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. That carries unanimously. Um, Mr. DeFrandi, could you offer us a motion regarding the water and sewer rates and the uh, DES development-related fees? Sure, happy to, Madam Chair. So um, with respect to um, H, I move that we adopt the amendment to cha Chapter 26 of the Arlington County Code, the Utilities Ordinance, Attachment 1 of the Staff Report, to increase water and sewer rates to become effective July 1st, 2022. With respect to Item I, this is Department of um, Environmental Services Development-related fees, I move that we increase the Department of Environmental Services development related fees in the area of street development and construction, erosion and sediment control, and the Chesapeake Bay Preservation Ordinance by an inflationary indicator of 4% effective July 1, 2022. I also move the county manager's recommendation with respect to um, subdivisions um, that we adopt an inflationary and, and, a, and also plat review and public impro improvement bond administration fees. Move the county manager's recommendation, which is to adopt an inflationary increase of 4% to DES development related fees as depicted on the DES permit and plan review fee schedule for chapter 22, chapter 57, section 57 8, and chapter 61. Section 61 4 of the County Code of Arlington, Virginia, related to charges for the review and approval of engineering plans, building permits, right of way use permit fees and other related permitting construction and inspection services as shown in attachment A of the staff report, effective July 1, 2022. In addition, adopt an ordinance as shown in attachment B to amend, reenact, and recodify chapter 23, section 23-11, subsection A of the County Code of Arlington, Virginia, related to an increase in plat review and public improvement bond administration fees by an inflationary factor of 4% effective July 1, 2022. If right. second, is there any discussion on those items? Seeing none, call for a vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, those two carry unanimously. Um, I think I had uh, saddled you with J and K as well. <laughs> sure. <laughs> you speak sure. Those. Happy to move um, J, uh, which is also relates to development fees, 
a different, uh, different variation of development fees, and then K, which relates to Department of Parks and Recreation fees. So specifically, with respect to J, I move that we adopt a new fee for the review of landscape plans for one and two family dwellings, technical corrections such as phase development site plan amendments and site plan resubmission fees by an inflationary increase of 4% and other changes to the Department of Community Planning, Housing and Development's development fund fees, including the Department of Environmental Services development related fees, except as noted as set forth in attachment A and B of the staff report, effective July 1st, 2022. That's item J. With respect to K, I move that we had, there's a series of fees. Um, I move that related to the Depart Department of Parks and Recreation. They're in the staff report. I move that we adopt the fiscal year 2023 Department of Parks and Recreation fee resolution attachment one of the staff report for item K. Sorry. Great, that's been moved. Those two have been moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, those carry unanimously. Thank you, Mr. DeFerranti. Um, we'll move now uh, to uh, the Parks and Recreation Field Fund um, and maybe uh, the Emergency Medical Services Fees Transport Mileage and Telehealth. Ms. Garvey, if you'd like to do those, and then I think you That's may want to take and I, and I have N as well, I think. Yeah, um, yeah and this is actually a follow-on to what Mr. DeFerranti did. So you set the fees, and now we're doing the structure. Seems to me maybe we should have done it the other way around, but that doesn't matter. Um, so anyway, I would like to move that we approve the amended procedures and new fee structure for the field fund um, in the board report dated March 21st, 2022. Just a second. Could I speak to it a tiny bit? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. We. I mean, we have. We've got 96 fields, um, and that's a lot of fields to take care of. And a, a study showed that we are way behind. Our folks are handling way more fields than most places around in in the region. In fact, just about anywhere else. Um, so this will add to maintenance staff and 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 hopefully um, help improve the um, the the. the uh, the condition of the fields. We hear about that a lot. And then um, it's the first, we changed the fees, but this is the first change in the fee structure since it was established in, in 2011. Um, and so that seemed like a, a good time to do that. So we have changed that structure and that people can read more if they'd like to. I think I won't say any more about it, but I think it's a good thing to do and happy to vote on it now. Very good. All right, unless there's further Second. discussion. Yeah, excellent. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that carries unanimously. Okay, yeah, and then the next one I have is to adopt, <laughs> I would like to move that we adopt the fee increase for the FY, uh, for FY23 for the Fire Department's Emergency Medical Services, EMS, Transportation, Mileage, and Telehealth as per attachment one of the board report um, dated March 29, 2022. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's been seconded. And I'll speak to it just a tiny bit. Uh, you know, everything costs have gone up, and we need to, we have not, the last fee increase was in FY17. Um, insurance typically handles um, transportation uh, in our emergency vehicles. Um, and sometimes individuals are billed directly, and we sort of want to reassure people that anyone who's having trouble paying, we work with them. Um, and no one should suffer financial hardship because of transport. So if you really need emergency help, call, despite Excellent. the change. Very good point. All right. All of those in favor of that motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. That too carries unanimously. And item N. All right. This one I suppose we may have some discussion about. But anyway, I would like to move that we approve the proposed FY 2023 play plan, pay plan as set forth in the attachments uh, 1 to 6 of the board report dated April 22nd, 2022. Sorry. And um, I'll just speak to it a little bit and then invite colleagues to say more. Um, this reflects the changes that were made. You know, we had a lot of discussion. Um, and obviously, um, the, the compensation for our employees has been a major, major issue for us. And I, I'm pleased we're able to take it. This is a, a, a big step forward. Um, and uh, as I say, we've had quite a bit of talk, uh, discussion about it. 5.5%, no, 5 .5%, I believe, for our general employees. Um, and it also um, helps our public safety adjusting the pay ranges um, that are in there. Um, also, I will mention that it increases the board salaries. Um, and at this point, it would put the chair at um, 83,413 and 16 cents apparently, and our members at 77,648 and 24 cents. That's um, an increase of about 20,000. We've had a lot of discussion with folks about it. I'm happy to talk about it more, but um, I think it's really important that um, 
pretty much anybody who's kind of qualified and wants to run is able to run. And right now, I think there's really a fight. And every year, it's gotten harder and harder for people to afford it. I've talked to far too many people who I think would make great county board members, and they tell me I simply can't afford to do it. So I'm hoping this is going to be a step in the right direction to make it, I think, actually more democratic, <laughs> better representation. So happy for other comments from my colleagues. Great. Mr. Devery, did you want to make comments? Sure. Um, thank you, Ms. Garvey, for bringing this forward. And I just want to um, be clear. My view is that for a, um, a locality that is approaching 240,000 people, um, the job of being a board member is a full-time job. There's been some analysis in the past as to the number of hours. Sometimes it's 50 or 60 hours per week, and sometimes it's 35. Um, but I think this is a full-time job, and I think irrespective of your policy views, we should see it that way. I just, the other point, and the only other point I wanted to make is that uh, I couldn't agree more with the concept that everybody should be able to serve. We should not have, this is not the Virginia of 200 years ago. We should have a county board where you can make a living off of serving in this role. That's my view because I think that's the way we'll have the best representative board that can make decisions that serve the whole community well. Those are just two points I feel compelled to make uh, because for transparency and also just to address the big issues. I think you're exactly right. Little d, democratic, so that everybody has a chance, irrespective of policy views, that you can serve. Thanks. Thanks. Um, and for my part, I'll just note, uh, you know, we, we had a, a quite a bit of discussion about two years ago. Um, those who follow the machinations of the board know that we are restricted by law. We can only raise the um, salary cap for board members um, in the year that two board members up for re-election. So in 2019, we had quite a bit of conversation, put a survey out to the community, um, and generally reached the consensus that we thought it would be appropriate to get to a point where board members made 100% um, of the area median income for a one-member household, I believe was the was the benchmark. Um, the, the idea there being that uh, uh, board members ought to make uh, not more than the average Arlingtonian, but not less either. Um, so this would get us, I think, about half of the way there. Um, I believe this is roughly shakes out to um, about a, a board member making 80% of the area median income for the house, a household of one. So it's sort of along that journey. Um, you know, I, I think... Uh, I have had some discomfort with this over the years. I think what ultimately has persuaded me to support this idea is the sort of depersonalizing it and the recognition that it's actually not about my salary, it's about a board member's salary. Um, one of the things that has frankly been most persuasive to me is the advocacy we have gotten from people who would very much like to see somebody else in these seats <laughs> advocating for higher salaries. Um, and, and the recognition, as my colleagues have said, um, that the, 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 the fact that this is a full-time job that does not pay like a full-time job has been an obstacle um, to the representation of different views. So I hope this will um, make contests for board seats uh, competitive in the future, um, uh, both in terms of who's running, but also in terms of who conceives of being able to run. Um, so I really appreciate that the many folks who have weighed in, um, not only throughout this budget process, but, in, but indeed in that conversation that we began two years ago and then was, of course, superseded by the pandemic. Um, it gives me some, some comfort, uh, although I do squirm a little bit still. I think it will always be a little uncomfortable to have to vote on one's own salary, but um, some comfort that this is uh, generally consistent with the desire of the community, uh, even those, again, community members who might like to see different board members, um, at least recognizing that this is a, a full-time job and ought to be paid as such. Um, colleagues, for other comments, Mr. Karen Tonis. Oh, thank you. Uh, so, as somebody who really struggles a lot to balance two jobs, uh, one one full time and another half time, so one hundred and fifty percent, it it has become really uh, very very difficult to to do that. Uh, it is very difficult to do that. There's an additional as I mentioned to that, not only the accessibility of this uh, of this office, it's also the fact that uh, you know many of us uh, will find uh, work here in Arlington and therefore, or with entities or, or employers who will have uh, eventually business before the county board. And so, you know, I find myself in a very uncomfortable situation to excuse myself every time on, 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 art, on item 11 or 12. This is, <laughs> has been established now every, every, you know, three or four times a year. Uh, this is really not, uh, you know, uh, helpful. So to say, it's not helpful for the board as a whole. It's not helpful for the way this body works. It's not helpful for anybody. So uh, the more we move towards a situation where a, uh, you know, acceptable, um, 
level of compensation is provided. And acceptable doesn't mean, and I agree with you, that doesn't mean a full-time job in an, an office doesn't mean, mean you know, any, any open-ended, full-time, quote-unquote, uh, compensation. It just means an, an average acceptable decent compensation, which uh, can, can be defended uh, in front of the taxpayer in this case. And I think that the taxpayer has come to a, po to a point where, uh, where uh, they, they uh, accept and understand that this had to happen at some point. Is a is a small, you know, progression towards a normality that we should aspire to have. Thank you, Mr. Dorsey. Thank you. As you constantly remind us, not everyone. It's all been said, but not everyone has said it. So I'm going to make sure no one uh, assumes anything by my silence on this. And uh, to just. Uh, you know, harken back to 2019, I remember, and Scott McCaffrey will probably remind me at the start of my year being chair, I, I said that this was an issue that I didn't want any part of, wasn't part of my agenda for what I wanted to accomplish. And, uh, you know, thanks to Ms. Garvey for uh, pressing the cause, and we did some great analysis then, which arrived at the point that you described, Ms. Crystal, for uh, setting the cap to adjust to uh, median individual income earners in Arlington, something that I do believe was fundamentally the right policy. And really, once you get past the discomfort of um, uh, having uh, making a decision that impacts your own uh, earnings, it really is, as you described so well. This is not about what we get paid; it's what about it's what board it's what board members should be paid. And I fully lean into the idea that uh, if we're going to be responsible to the future of this community, this is a necessary vote to take because it is not about us. We are temporary occupants, but setting uh, the standard that hopefully will be reaffirmed by future boards who have an opportunity to ensure that CAP um, moves in a way that does allow for a broader group of people to serve is absolutely important. And uh, once we think about it in those terms, I think the discomfort, at least for me, washes away a fair amount. Thank you. Great, thank you. Okay, then I think we are ready for a vote on the pay plan, which again, as Ms. Garvey noted in speaking to the motion, includes um, the salaries of uh, thousands of employees of Arlington County, not just the board members, but I appreciate the opportunity to speak to that. Yeah, issue. and I think we'll talk about that, I hope, in the, in, the, in our Absolutely. final want to, because that actually, we want that to be, that's the big, the, it's our place okay. we need to be. Yeah. Great, okay. Um, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that carries unanimously. Um, and Mr. Carantonis, if you could speak to item O, or make a motion for item O and P, I'd be so, grateful. Uh, here. So the, uh, this is, these are two lesser items, but uh, uh, at least on the first one, item O, we heard a lot of advocacy. We heard a lot of uh, um, uh, affected uh, individuals and artists uh, uh, testifying. So this is the um, increased Lee Art Center, still called Lee Art Center. Use fees, administered by Arlington Economic Development. The, the motion is to adopt the increased Lee Art Center use fees administered by the Arlington Economic Development as set forth in the schedule in the board report. Uh, uh, I, I may, uh, I don't know, is there a second first? Second. For a say? second. So as, as you remember, this was a, uh, a topic that we heard a lot of advocacy the fees have gone have gone uh, up so they, they've almost doubled the fees so this uh, the the f philosophy here is to cover the cost of the program uh, while uh, the um, the Liard center is is kind of in, in a in a limbo still operating but with a, with a lot of caveats and a lot of uh, questions that haven't been cleared yet about its more long-term future so um, uh, we haven't, uh, as I understand it from many conversations, we haven't found a way uh, to uh, provide relief there, uh, either financial or by allowing to, uh, um, uh, to increase the membership of that program. So at this point, uh, uh, the recommendation of the manager, which I am moving right now, is to uh, uh, proceed with the higher fees. Thank you. I appreciate that. Any other comments, Mr. DeFranti? Just a one one question for the for the manager. I'm trying to recall s status. I think that we will. There's a broader discussion about the longer term future. That's part of the the CIP discussion. Is that a pro is that correct? Yes. Thank you. Thank you for raising that. The conversation will very much continue. Yeah. Oh, everything is really uh, contingent on uh, what 
what the future of this uh, building and this facility will look like, which we'll have the opportunity to discuss that in about a month. Thank you. you know, one other question, I guess, for the manager. Um, I believe we have, in Parks and Rec, we have sliding scales, so that there are sliding scales that apply to the Lee Arts Center, correct? Yes, there's, so for all our Parks and Recreation programs, there are um, opportunities available for people. It's based on income mm -hmm. to receive a fee reduction. Yeah, no, thank you. I mean, so the fees have been, have increased quite a bit, but we, those who have, um, you know, income issues can still participate. All, all discounts apply, if, if there are any. There, yes. they apply. a very good point. Absolutely, because we did hear um, a desire from some of those who spoke during the session that um, uh, this be looked at as is everything in our budget through an equity lens, and uh, if it costs is an obstacle to participation for a lower income artist, and we look forward to applying those um, sliding scale programs. Okay, unless there's any further discussion, I think we're ready for a vote on that one as well. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that carries unanimously. And last, but by last no means least, possibly least. Maybe but. least. <laughs> But it's, you know, if, if you allow the expression, it's the cutest one. So <laughs> uh, this is a, an elimination of a fee. So this is about, the, it's, uh, the, the, the motion is to adopt the proposed amendment to Chapter 2, Animals and Fowl, Section 2-12, Licensing of Dogs of the Code of Arlington County, Virginia, to eliminate the fee for a duplicate dog license tag. Uh, uh, as everybody knows, uh, this is a $1 expense that is really very annoying to those who have to pay that. So, Great. Yeah. Okay. So I think, yes, uh, well put. I don't think there's any further discussion. Um, all of those in favor of this motion, please say aye. 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 All right. Any opposed? Okay. That carries unanimously. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a fiscal 2023 budget. I'm going to turn now to colleagues who might like to make comments. Um, Mr. DeFranti, would you like to start? Sure. Um, I'm happy to, to start. I'm sure that um, we just took a, a number of actions. And the big picture, as I see it, is that this budget continues our recovery by investing in our workforce, our public servants. Um, and it helps moves, uh, move us toward the renewal that we need. What do I mean by that? I think that the supply, supply chain issues that we're seeing um, are a piece of recovering from the pandemic. And while um, we have a low unemployment rate in the community, um, we still are recovering. And that's very true for uh, our workforce who uh, stepped up in ways that are too numerous to count um, to serve over the past two plus years, two years, two months uh, during the course of this pandemic. So, Compensation um, is a key central piece uh, of this budget, and it's what's guided my thinking as we approach this budget. So making sh the, the increases in valuing our staff as a whole, our um, Department of Human Services, our first responders, our, um, our employees who have kept us safe and worked so hard to do it, that is at the heart of why I support the budget and the numerous items that we have, we have worked on. Um, I'm very pleased and grateful um, for the progress we made with respect to um, climate and addressing this Office of Climate Coordination and Policy. I think that will help our existing team, and I'm grateful for the manager for the leadership on that. I want to note again um, the housing positions with respect to the quality of existing uh, housing units, existing CAFs is critical, as well as the resources that will help us as we, ad we address Barcroft and the development that will proceed there. One thing that I don't know that we have talked about in detail is, our, is what this budget does with respect to our schools. Um, our schools are, are valuing uh, their staff as well, which I think is appropriate. It has been a very difficult time to be an educator or work in our public schools, which have been for so long the heartbeat of Arlington, and it's just been a very difficult past two years. So those are key pieces of this um, and key pieces of the work. Um, grateful for the other specific amendments that seek to address important priorities um, like our partnerships, the tree study, the jail um, analysis of medical piece and the nonprofits. Um, there's much, much more to do, 
um, and building a systemically equitable community is going to take a lot more. Um, but I, I also won't say that this budget is is exactly as I would have written every little thing. It's not perfect from any per, any one person's point of view, um, and there will be those who who might have critiques. But I think if you say you value public service and public servants in our workforce and our first responders and our staff, you have to show that with your budget, and this budget does that. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. DeFranti. Mr. Dorsey. Thank you, Mr. De Madam Chair and Mr. DeFranti. Mr. DeFranti, you know, rarely are budgets ever perceived by anyone as perfect. Um, as you well noted, uh, and in, a, in an environment where we were not able to allocate and respond to every request or design every uh, element of a program according to some of our interested parties' uh, best intentions, I do believe this budget meets the criteria of being both responsible and responsive, and I applaud everyone who, who worked very hard on it. You know, first and foremost, we were able to create sufficient contingencies to account for the lingering effects of the pandemic. Very important, as I believe personally, that this will have a very long tail and will reverberate long into the future in needs that are uh, known and ones that have yet to manifest. But we've also at the same time been able to ensure that service delivery throughout all of Arlington County's government uh, is at a level that our residents have come to expect, um, and that is a ray of hope in light of our looking toward the post-pandemic world. We've also been able to make some good strategic investments in deferred priorities, deferred for good reasons, as we were constrained in our funding over the past couple of years and concerned about the worst happening. Fortunately, those things didn't happen to Arlington and we're able to move forward with, uh, with staffing up and delivering in, in program areas that were deferred. But at the same time, we're able to make some new increase in investments in areas that are absolutely essential for Arlington to continue to be the kind of place that its residents are proud of and its stakeholders are attracted to. With sustainability, the new Office of Climate Coordination and Policy, along with the $1 million impact fund, is incredibly uh, important. Affordable housing, pleased that we're able to maintain our efforts when it comes to our uh, AHIF program, but also that we're able to substantially plus up our investment in housing grants to ensure that we're meeting a greater need for those Arlingtonians who are the most income constrained and vulnerable to our incredibly high housing cost region. Thrilled that we're able to make significant steps forward with equity, uh, standing up and sufficiently resourcing our community oversight board to uh, enhance trust with our law enforcement community while also uh, taking some steps forward to demonstrate a uh, commitment to delivering equity in areas that are suffering from significant disparities. On the mental health side, the investments in crisis intervention and licensed clinicians to serve the growing need in our community is an important step forward to making, making sure that we're keeping everyone as healthy as we, we possibly can and looking at all dimensions of health. Thrilled that we're able to fully fund our schools and appreciate their partnership in being able to deliver on some of their key priorities without putting an additional strain on resources beyond the revenue sharing agreement that we have. We're also able to fund our regional commitments, no small thing in this area where other communities are needing to take a finer look at uh, what they do on a regional or on a bilateral and a regional uh, basis. And of course, compensation, which uh, has been alluded to, so I won't go on at length, but uh, when we do the public's business, uh, we, we cannot do that effectively without really good public servants. And you know, for far too long, public servants, compared to their private sector counterparts, uh, make sacrifices that often go un underappreciated. In the private sector, people can sometimes take advantage of market swings to increase their earnings. They can enjoy profit sharing depending on the enterprise, but those who do their work for the public sector do so for the public good. We shouldn't take advantage of their skills and talent by depriving them of quality and growing living standards to meet their needs for, for living. And so this makes a substantial step forward in ensuring that our compensation meets the market demands, the requirements of the jobs 
that they perform and rewards them for their good work and allows them to continue to make the choice to work in the public sector, which we do appreciate. I recognize that all of this comes with um, you know, the challenge that is before us every year when we set a tax rate that doesn't grow. It's like, how do you do all of these things that you prioritize and you want to do? And as it relates to our revenues, you know, we tell a story that we haven't increased the tax rate, and certainly that is a, an honest thing and that is a good thing, but we are not oblivious to the fact that the growing revenues to accommodate the budget deliverables that we've just talked about comes mostly on the heels of <coughs> residential real estate taxpayers who in some cases have suffered significant increases year over year in what their tax bills are. And I would love to be able to deliver for people predictable and, and moderate increases in the real estate tax rate of around 3%. Uh, unfortunately, it's just not possible uh, given the nature of the real estate valuation. And it's also uh, a challenge given that in the Commonwealth of Virginia, localities are primarily, primarily reliant on real estate tax rates to fund local government. I wish that would change. And I was encouraged to hear that the CIF Fed is interested maybe in doing some work to look at some statewide advocacy to see whether or not we can come up with some proposals on how we can fund local government to be less reliant on real estate tax rates, understanding that volatility and the stressors that that can put on people whose incomes may not necessarily have kept up. So with that, pleased to reach the end of another budget season, one in which I think we can be proud of the work that we've done for the Arlington community. As always, I thank Mr. Schwartz, but most specifically, Ms. Meredith, Mr. Stevenson, um, and Emily, why in the world am I forgetting your last name? Hughes, thank you um, at this moment for all of your incredible work. Uh, I, I, I'm just amazed at how you all are just so calm in the face of what is just a flurry of, of activity every year and the added complexity with the personal property tax rate this year. You all are the essence of professionalism and unflappability. I admire you, I appreciate you, and, and thanks again. Thanks so much. Mr. Karen Tonis. Thank you. I should, uh, I should start by thanking you for all this and to congratulate you to the fiscal year 24 budget season. <laughs> <laughs> that has already begun, right? We, we voted already on fiscal year 23. Uh, indeed, and, and Madam Chair, also for your work. Uh, this, um, it's often not appreciated how much uh, work uh, the chair and the, and the vice chair are putting into this. And uh, you're the conductor of a, of a huge or orchestra of uh, of, of you know demands, and I believe that this uh, this was a very successful outcome here for all the reasons that have been um, mentioned before. I agree with Mr. De Ferranti. Uh, this is a this is the first budget in the first year that looks like uh, an exit from the emergency modus. Uh, but uh, and I agree with Mr. Dorsey that we don't really know where uh, what the tale of this is. Uh, we have suffered. Uh, since we were talking about tax rates, uh, uh, it's indeed so that a, an increasing part of our deliverables um, that have to be of very high quality and that are framed at the level of expectation that is appropriate for a for a developed and mature community like the one that we are, and very vocal also community, uh, that this is this this uh, this level of expectation is. Uh, is right now mostly served by an increase in uh, the uh, property tax that comes from residential properties. Uh, while our commercial sector has been relatively flat in delivery right now, and this is not uh, unrelated to the pandemic. So uh, I do believe, and if, if there is a uh, uh, takeaway for me and for everybody is that it is it really matters to pay attention uh, to how our commercial sector will be um, uh, functioning and delivering in the future that's uh, very very important we we need more performance there in order to balance uh, the you know the traditional Arlington way which used to be 50 50 and it's not anymore so uh, and uh, if, if there are things that I am specifically very pleased to see materializing. I do believe that we have a new uh, climate uh, direction here. It is a small amount of money that we have appropriated, but the policy um, 
backing of that is significant, I believe. Uh, not only have, uh, is the AIR program, uh, uh, you know, has our, our support and backing, also the, uh, the new uh, Office of Climate Response uh, and Policy is, uh, is a very promising position, uh, married with the $1 million of discretionary funding that the county manager will have and will, uh, will come very handy when we will be discussing the implementation firm framework for the uh, uh, community energy plan. Uh, this, uh, I very much hope, I look forward this to be a very qu a qualitative uh, step forward in, uh, in upping our game, in, in converting us into a leader in a place that uh, just sends the right message that we take climate, the climate emergency very, very seriously. And we are ready to make, um, you know, difficult decisions to move towards a more decarbonized Arlington, a greener Arlington, after all. Uh, with the help of everybody and touching indeed also in involving and engaging also the, 90, the famous 94% of uh, general society and not only our own government. So on housing, um, I think that uh, uh, this past year has been a uh, tremendous, uh, you know, course in learning about uh, what the new challenges of housing are and, and how uh, important the, the response and, and what the level of response should be. Uh, the Barcroft deal is uh, just one, uh, the most important, but just one, uh, one instance of that, but also the entire discussion around uh, the Serrano and what we mean when we, say, when we say quality, affordable housing, stable, affordable housing that supports indeed our equity, uh, our most vulnerable Arlingtonians in our vision of equity in Arlington. And I think that the budget has, uh, has appropriated the, the, the financial means to support this. And thank you, Mr. Deferrante, specifically for working so hard on this. I do think that uh, uh, there are still areas to improve, like in the fair housing arena, et cetera, but the seeds are already there. And I believe that the capacity with the, with the Department of uh, with CPHD uh, will be able to uh, bring us forward there as well. I was very pleased also about the uh, significant successive imp improvements and investments we did in, we, we did in mental health. Uh, I just remember a couple of when in my first budget how impossible certain appropriations have seemed. Like, for example, the first uh, psychosis episode response, and now uh, it has been possible. And that's a huge step forward. So, all in all, um, I do think that this is a balanced budget. This is a budget that uh, this reflects our values as a whole, um, and most importantly, reflects our. Uh, uh, trust in good governance. And this trust is supported, is, is what is at the base of the whole discussion about compensation for public employees. I do think that uh, we saw, uh, we, we had to, to discuss very tough uh, challenges. Uh, we have seen departments losing a lot of personnel, not being able to staff. Uh, the, the services that uh, we asked them to provide. And I think that we uh, made the right decisions uh, with, uh, with, uh, you know, with significant improvement in the compensation of our public employees. I trust that this will bring us forward, that this will improve our staffing levels and that will you know, support the services that we haven't been able to, to support because we just couldn't staff them appropriately. And that starts uh, with, um, with uh, public safety, which uh, has been really at the brink, and mental health response that I have mentioned before. So again, thank you so much for all this work, and I look forward to implementing the budget now. Thank you, Mr. Carantonis. Ms. Garvey? Yeah, thank you. So I think as I've said to all of you at times, this just feels different to me this year. Now, Christian said, Olivia, it's just because the past two years have been so strange, we've all forgotten what a regular budget year feels like. <laughs> There's something to that. Um, but I also do think it's different. Um, in the past, we used to have, we spent hours listening to ha housing advocates. Um, and the housing advocates were certainly here, but we've really, I think, stepped up the game in, in housing a lot. So this time now we're hearing from environmental advocates, and that's what sort of, it's just, it's interesting to see how things are changing. Um, I think the national narrative has been helpful to us because 
everybody knows what problem the environment's in, and you don't have to persuade people that we need to do something about the environment. Same with actually um, our employees. It used to be trying to increase pay when I was on the school board for teachers. So you'd get pushed back, and why should the public employees get a pay? I don't get a pay. And nobody's really said that now, because they know that we're all in trouble. It's, it's our employees on which we depend, and we, can't, we can say all the wonderful words we want to up here, but if we don't have people to do the work, it doesn't happen. Um, and we've got to treat those people well. So I, this feels like a real transition. I think a lot of seeds are being planted, and I'm not going to enumerate them because I just sort of started developing this idea and I talked far too long. But I'm just feeling we're, tra we're changing a lot. Just actually the, the presentation we had from the manager on changing how we do our zoning, you know, and the permitting stuff. I mean, I really think we're making some great changes. So thanks for staff. Thank you, Mr. Manager, for putting together a really good budget. Um, I think it really was good. I think that's part of the reason we didn't get a whole lot of people coming to talk to us. And then at the end, we all started to realize, oh my, there's this one-time money and there's this one thing. I think the last 48 hours have been a little <laughs> tough on everybody, especially our staff. Thank you so very much. Um, lots of calculations and back and forth. Um, and I really want to thank, thank the staff. Um, and thank my colleagues and our chair for leading us through this. Uh, I really appreciate it. We've had a lot of back and forth, some disagreements, some things we still disagree on, but it's all been collaborative and collegial, and we've really worked it out well. It's, it's, it is a pleasure to be on this board. I think I've said that before. It is a real pleasure. I've been on a lot of boards, and this is a great one, I'm saying. Um, and staff's great. I, I, I think our staff work is wonderful. I actually, on this board, on this budget, am most pleased with what we are doing for our employees. I found most years we're always talking about raising employees, and I say we get pushed back, whatever, and we eke out a little bit. And I wish we could do more, but this feels like a significant um, uh, contribution to improving the compensation. I think that's a trend that's probably going to have to continue. I think that's a good thing. I think public service de deserves to be paid well, because where would we be without good public servants? So they make Arlington what it is. And um, right now, this is, I think, a great community. Not perfect, but we're constantly working on improving, and this budget is part of that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Garvey. <clears throat> Well, I want to um, start with echoing the words of my colleagues and giving just significant thanks to the Department of Management and Finance, especially um, to the county manager's office, particularly Michelle Cowan this year, and the manager himself. Uh, certainly, uh, as, as chair, you develop new appreciation for the skills that you all have as mental health counselors, as well as, uh, you know, bean counters. We really <laughs> appreciate you so much. Um, and particularly, I think, you know, we really saw the benefit um, of the communications team within the CMO this year, both on the front end, you know, really the engagement that went into asking this community what mattered to them on this budget, and then at the back end, um, in terms of the visual communication that we're able to do. And I'm actually going to ask um, our clerk to, to pull up a couple of the slides as I talk, you know, so, so um, while I bore everybody by repeating what my colleagues have already said, they can see some of the specifics. Um, you know, just to begin, ultimately, as colleagues have said, whatever our priorities are for county government, they come down to people. And so ultimately, so does this budget. Arlington has really high standards for everything, from how quickly potholes get filled to how effectively site plan conditions are enforced. And maintaining the staff that can perform at those really high standards means employing talented people, and those people have choices. And yet many Arlington employees have held on. They've continued to deliver incredibly important and in many cases frontline in-person services throughout two pandemic years, even when instability in our revenues meant negligible salary increases. My hope is that the county board's actions on compensation with this budget can communicate to all of our employees how much we value them and appreciate the sacrifices they've made during the pandemic. We are adding compensation increases for all general employees above the manager's recommendation, fulfilling our promise to treat the increases that we agreed upon back in December as a floor and not a ceiling. And as noted in guidance, we're investing half a million dollars in strategic retention and signing bonuses for our hardest to fill positions. That includes, but it is hardly limited to, our frontline mental health workers and the crews based out of our trade center. There are big increases for public safety. The investment in our police is obviously notable. We are in a moment of so much opportunity and so much worry when it comes to policing in Arlington. Opportunity because of the extraordinary levels of work that our residents and civil rights advocates and the police themselves have put into rethinking policing to build trust and justice from the new Civilian Oversight Board to deeper partnership with the Department of Home Human Services in addressing behavioral health calls for service. But worry because compensation concerns paired with national trends in people leaving the profession, electing not to enter the profession, these are hollowing out our department 
It is increasing over time. It's narrowing the police department's focus to reactive calls for service. It's decimating the capacity of our police to spend time building neighborhood relationships or serving on interagency efforts to address the root causes of vexing public safety problems from DUIs to domestic violence, or just in general following through on our shared vision for community policing. I hope that this budget can communicate to our current officers that we want you with us for this transformational time and for the long haul and can communicate to prospective officers that Arlington is a place to come build a career in a community that is itself building great things in law enforcement. And while the inclination towards comparison is about as human as an instinct as it gets, I also want to emphasize that the 8.5% salary increases for our sheriff's deputies and fire department, along with big investments to decompress pay and thousands of dollars in bonuses, they are without precedent in recent decades. Our action to fund these historic re increases represents not just the boards, but all of Arlington's appreciation for your work, for its difficulties, and for your dedication to it. With regard to climate, we spoke about climate at length last Thursday, and in particular, the introduction of a new Office of Climate Coordination and Policy to work hand in glove with the AIR team to elevate and amplify our climate commitments and strategies. There is a teaching in my faith translated generally as, it is not your responsibility to complete the work of repairing the world, but neither are you free to desist from it. Of course, Arlington alone cannot arrest or reverse climate change and all its devastating impacts. But of course, Arlington, with all our advantages in innovation and our resources and all of our own high stakes in catastrophic climate-related flooding, must achieve our own urgent contributions to this goal. The story that's here is the start. And I am really looking forward to working with the new OCCP and AIR to embrace and supercharge our roadmap to our community energy plan commitments. With regard to housing, we've talked quite a bit in the past two months about how equity shows up in this budget. And of course, I want to commend actually not only Samia Bird and Amber Barnett, but all of our race and equity cohort leaders, which are in, who are in every department, helping their colleagues apply equity analyses and equity principles to this budget. If we're looking for a line item on equity, the tens of millions of dollars spent on housing in this budget is a pretty strong proxy for it. Without these investments in housing for our low income and moderate income neighbors, so much of the rest of our budget, to say nothing of our collected values of integration and opportunity, are hollow when it comes to equity. After all, we can achieve equity among residents very quickly and equally meaninglessly if there's no income diversity in Arlington. I'm really proud that we're investing more than $60 million in housing this year. But money doesn't absolve us of our own complicity in creating the conditions of housing scarcity and unaffordability through restrictive zoning. So this budget is a first step towards housing affordability in 2022, but it is certainly not the last. Budgets are about trade-offs, and there's more that I wish we could have done with this year's. As Mr. Dorsey was intimating, we know that the ownership housing market's vertiginous increases over the last couple of years have not only priced out would-be owners, but have also led to significant growth in the assessed value of residential property taxes. Although I am glad that we could hold to our property tax rate of $1 and a penny in the third per hundred of dollars of assessed value among the lower in the region, I know that we all would have preferred to be in the situation of our peer jurisdictions who are less dependent on commercial revenue sources and are therefore entertaining rate cuts this year. But by investing in our people, specifically investing in retention and recruitment for the positions and divisions where quality of service is most threatened, and prioritizing the urgent as well as important issues of housing, equity, and climate, I am optimistic that this budget will be one that doesn't just bridge the pandemic, but begins our journey on the other side. So thank you, colleagues. I'm so pleased uh, that we are uh, able to, to move forward on the fiscal 2023 budget and to have a whole uh, three weeks to rest and recharge before we begin the process again on the capital improvement plan. So with that, I believe we are ready for our next item. Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Clerk, could you call item 43, please? Yes, of course. Item 43, site plan 177-U-22-1 is a use permit for a capital bike share station at Virginia Hospital Center, located at 1701 North George Mason Drive. Thank you so much. Mr. Manager, I believe we've got staff for a presentation. I am so excited that Emma Martin. Can we applaud yes. our, 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 our staff? Oh, yes, oh, yeah. applaud our team of staff. Talk to you tomorrow about the CIP. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I'm so excited that uh, Emma Martin, who, uh, did you start during the pandemic? December of 2019. Oh, December of 2019. This, this is, yeah, this is her first time in the boardroom, so I'm very excited to have her here. She will be presenting this item with assistance from Dennis Sellen as needed, but I'll turn it over to you, Ms. Martin. Good evening. Hello, I'm Emma Martin. As mentioned with Arlington County's Planning Division, tonight I'll be presenting the Capital Bike Share Use Permit item. The applicant is requesting a use permit for a 15 dock bike share station at the corner of the Virginia Hospital Center property at 1701 North George Mason Drive. The location of the proposed bike share is shown on the slide with a yellow star. The use permit is proposed to implement a site plan condition which obligated the Virginia Hospital Center to fund installation and 10 years of maintenance and operation costs for the station. The proposal is consistent with the approved site plan, the license agreement that was approved in March of 2022, as well as the bicycle element of the master transportation plan. The bicycle element of the master transportation plan places emphasis on a robust, versatile, multimodal transportation system in which bicycles play an integral role in managing transportation plan for a growing population. As shown on the map, North George Basin Drive is identified for a planned bike lane, and 16th Street North is identified as an on-street bike route. This proposal meets policy 15 of the bicycle element of the Master Transportation Plan, which is to coordinate with regional partners and, provide, and private providers to increase bike sharing across the Arlington and Washington, D.C. region. The image on the left on this slide is the approved civil site plan for the Virginia Hospital Center, showing the location of the proposed bike share in the same general location as is shown in the application on the left in the image, or in the right, on the right, sorry. Per the site plan, the existing five foot sidewalk will be widened to accommodate a 10 foot shared use path. The bike share station will be located at the edge of the widened sidewalk and it will be perpendicular to North George Mason Drive with no impact to the sidewalk's ultimate clear width. Staff contacted the John M. Langston Citizens Association, the Terry Leeway Heights, Waycroft Woodlawn and Bluemont civic associations, and the community expressed concerns with existing traffic, the lack of bike lanes in the area, safety of bicyclists, the location of the proposed station, emergency vehicles access, accessibility for the existing parking on North George Mason Drive, bikes adding potentially to traffic congestion, bikes potentially blocking the sidewalk, as well as the existing station at nearby Lacey Woods Park. The proposed bike share station was a site plan feature that was provided to assist in mitigating the impacts of the development and furthers the goals of transportation plans and policies. And in staff's perspective, the expansion of the sidewalk in this area will be sufficient to accommodate a shared use path for both pedestrians and cyclists who do not choose to use the road. As proposed, staff does not anticipate that the use will create undue adverse impacts on the surrounding community, will not be detrimental to public welfare or injurious to public to property or improvements in the neighborhood and will not be in conflict with the purposes of the master plan. Therefore, staff recommends approval of this use permit subject to conditions with a county board review in one year, which will give staff, the community, and the county board time to assess the impact of the bike share station and to make revisions should the use have any adverse impacts identified or if there are any conflicts with the station. This concludes my presentation. Um, here with me tonight, I have Aaron Schreiber from CPHD and Dennis Sullen from DES virtually, and we'd be happy to answer questions if you have any. Great. Thanks so much, Ms. Martin. Um, I believe that we have a presentation from a uh, applicant, so to speak, from uh, um, the bike share. Is that right? Mr. Namaya? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Good evening, Mr. Namaya. Do you have a presentation for us? Are you available for questions? I I'm happy to turn the floor to you if you had a um, presentation for us, and if you're just available for questions, that's great too. Ah, uh, sure, I, I can, um, uh, much of what I was gonna present was actually already presented by Emma, so great. thank you, Emma. Um, and um, uh, I guess just wanted to add that uh, we, uh, Capital Bike Share will be providing roughly between eight to 9,000 trips per year is what's, what I'm estimating. And that um, if a station were not present, obviously, uh, many of those trips uh, by that would have been by bike will be by motor vehicles, um, adding to more motor vehicle traffic, pollution, and noise to the surrounding neighborhoods. So um, certainly don't want that to happen and um, uh, think that the Capital Bike Share service for the neighborhood would be a, a good asset for the, the neighborhood and also the hospital. 
Um, so uh, that's really all I have to say, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you all may have. Thank you so much, Mr. DeMeo. Um, glad to have you this evening. Uh, Mr. Clerk, do we have any speakers? There are no public speakers. Okay. Um, the conversation is now with the board. I'll note we, this Could was- Could I make a motion just oh, to get us yes, started? Yes, please, Ms. Garvey. Yeah, yes, I'd love yes. to do that. All right, I'd like to move that we approve the use permit for a capital bike share station to be sited on the Virginia Hospital Center property, located at 1701 North George Mason Drive, subject to the conditions of the staff report with a county board review in one year. That's April 2023. The staff board report was uh, dated April 15. Second. Great, thank you so much. Did you want to speak to that? Sure, uh, just briefly. Um, one. I think it's great. I think actually, I was thinking about a hospital. This is a great location to encourage bike riding. So I think that's that's good. I always like it when somebody else is paying for the installation and maintenance for 10 years. That sounds great. And then if there are any concerns, we're going to be looking at it in a year, um, which is a good amount of time. And um, I, I, we'll, we'll, we'll hold you to that nine to 10,000 ridership. See, see if you can get it to be a little bit more than that, Mr. DeMeo. <laughs> that would be kind of cool. Um, those are my remarks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Garvey. And I'll note, we had put this on our regular agenda because of some concerns from the surrounding neighborhoods, uh, but I do think they've largely been addressed through the staff plan. Um, you know, and, and I will note, as, as you indicated, Ms. Garvey, not only because of the nexus with you know health and clean air with the hospital, um, you know, I, having lived through that the, those hearings, plural, for the Virginia Hospital Center site plan in 2018, you know, most of us recall there were a lot of conversations about how um, Virginia Hospital Center, as one of Arlington's greatest, largest employers, right? We often think of. Um, patients or visitors to the hospital, but it is also one of the county's largest employers um, could engage in some meaningful transportation demand management behavior um, to really reduce the number of cars uh, coming on site every day. And I will note, um, I was actually doing doing the map. This is Virginia Hospital Center. This, the, the bike share location will be a 10 minute bike ride from the Boston Metro um, using the 16th Street route, which the staff report described, right? If, if uh, folks want to ride on George Mason, it's a little less, but I think they'll probably be using the 16th Street route, um, which is you know, really within the ideal window of what we look for, for trying to encourage um, employee behavior. Um, so if this encourages somebody to, to try biking, to rely on um, cabbie as part of their uh, daily commute practice, that is fewer cars on the road, that's fewer folks um, looking to find off street parking in surrounding neighborhoods, which I know was a huge area of concern um, uh, and all told, I think, a benefit, although I do appreciate um, the neighborhoods for engaging in this and raising these concerns. As Ms. Garvey indicated, I think we, we absolutely plan to monitor um, and uh, we know that this has been a site of a great deal of disruption during construction, right? Um, and so I think we're, we're all looking forward to things settling out, uh, uh, a new normal taking place and hopefully um, getting quite a few of those Virginia Hospital Center employees and maybe visitors um, out of their cars and uh, um, onto Capital Bike Share will be part of that new normal. So any other comments from colleagues? Seeing none, I think we, uh, oh, please, uh, Mr. Cardonis. Just, just a, a question. So the neighborhood or those uh, who have uh, requested this item to be pulled from the consent agenda? Oh, to be no. clear, they did not request that the item to be ah. pulled. We chose to put it on the regular agenda because of the opposition from three surrounding civic ah. associations. Okay. Uh, for for uh, Mr. DeMaio and our staff, uh, am I wrong if I say that the, this section of uh, George Mason Boulevard is one of the least service, so, I mean, the, the section that least service have. I mean, the, it's not really very well served. With this addition here, we, we are adding a significant point of service. That's correct. We're, we're moving northward towards Langston Boulevard more. So I think this, this uh, new site will give more opportunity to residents and visitors and employees um, getting them somewhere closer to where they may work or live or need to need to be. So yes, uh, we are we are moving into new neighborhoods and expanding the services reach. I can tell you that every single time I had to buy to find a bike, I, I was always assuming that there is a bike share somewhere next to hospital, but there was none. And that was really disappointing. <laughs> We've been working on the station for nearly a decade, so we're we're very very excited to to have it, uh, especially with climate change, uh, as you all spoke about earlier, uh, being more impactful. So uh, uh, we will have more e-bikes as well, uh, not to push them too much, but um, they will be coming online later this year, and so that'll make it even easier for people who may not consider themselves cyclists to get around by bike very easily. That's spectacular news. Yes, amen. All right, all those in favor, please say aye. 
Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, well, uh, glad to do that after 10 years in the making, right? Um, and thank you to our staff, too, for your work in collaboration with Capital Bike Share on this item and for joining us in person tonight. Mr. Clerk, is there any other, other business to come before the board? There are no further items. All right, with great pleasure, we are adjourned. <laughs>